Good day, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this very special event of the British Association for Canadian Studies, co-hosted by the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network, or QAN. I'm Christina, and I'm a project director with QAN. I am joined today by my colleague, Glenn Patterson, who we'll be meeting in just a moment. Um, he'll be helping out with the technical side um, of, uh, of today's event. First off, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Quan, uh, we are a province-wide organization uh, engaged with its members in the preservation and promotion of the history, heritage, and culture of Quebec, and in particular of Quebec's English-speaking communities. Uh, today's event wouldn't be possible without the support of Heritage Canada and, of course, support from our members. Um, membership in Quan is open to everyone, regardless of linguistic or cultural affiliation. And one of the perks of Quan membership is receiving our printed quarterly uh, publication, Quebec Heritage News Magazine, which brings you stories from all across the province highlighting Quebec's rich and diverse history. For more details on membership, please visit our website at qahn.org or send us a message right here on our Facebook page. Now, before we head over to the BAX conference, I'd like to introduce everyone to Quan's president, Grant Myers, who will say a few words to open today's event. Over to you, Grant. Thank you. Oh, of course. Thank you, Christine, and welcome, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network and our board of directors, I'd like to express how delighted we are to be an organizing partner for this event. Collaboration with organizations like the British Association for Canadian Studies is an important component of our ability to deliver both to our members and to the public quality programming that brings fresh perspectives on the history of Canada and Quebec. I hope sincerely that we will be able to find other opportunities to work together in the future. Now, while work commitments uh, prevent me from joining you this afternoon, I do want to wish you a very successful conference. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Grant. Um, now, before we get started, I'm going to pass things over to uh, Glenn Patterson, who is our tech expert, and uh, he'll just be giving some guidelines prior to today's conference. Hello, everyone. Oops, just a second. Getting ahead of myself. <laughs> um, so I'm here helping with the tech. Um, so first things are, if you're an audience member, you, you might notice that you can't unmute yourself, and that's intentional. Um, in the Q&A, um, I can unmute you on your behalf. Um, so if you're on a computer um, and if you're not familiar with Zoom, the mute button is in the bottom left, as is the start video button. So you can turn off both your microphone or turn it on as well as your video. Um, if you're on a mobile device, a smartphone, tablet, you might have to tap the screen once and then you'll see the uh, at the bottom, the mute button and the start and stop video. I would ask that uh, unless you're presenting, um, if you're just an audience member, uh, maybe keep your video off uh, when, unless you're asking a question. Um, just during the presentation part, it will uh, give free up a bit of extra bandwidth for our speakers. Um, so for the Q and A, when we get there, um, what I would say to everyone is, um, if you have a question to ask, just uh, go in the chat box in Zoom. That's on, in the bottom of the screen if you're on a computer, and again, if you're on a mobile, you'll have to tap the screen, go into the more section, and you should see chat. Go in the, there and just say, um, I have a question I wanna ask and then we'll create a queue and we'll just go one, one after the other and I'll, I'll unmute you and you can come on the mic and ask your questions. Um, then you can also use the raise hand feature if you know where it is, not everyone does, but if you're a, if you're a veteran user, um, you, can, you can do that as well. So I believe that is all I have. I will say that um, we are recording this session uh, on Zoom and, uh, we're also streaming live to Facebook. Um, if you're an audience member and you maybe don't want to be on the recording, whatever, I would say you can just check us out on the Facebook stream, but you're welcome to stay here as well and just keep your video off, whatever you prefer. Um, that's all I have for now. And I'll help you. If you have any questions, just uh, go in the chat box. And um, that's what I'm here for. So Christina, back over to you. Thanks, Glenn. So without any further delay, we're going to get started with today's BACS conference. I'm going to hand things over to BACS President James Kennedy, who's going to officially open today's conference. <laughs> 
Thanks, Christina. Uh, so, je voulais vous donner le bienvenue à cette uh, petite conférence du BACS. Uh, je m'appelle Jimmy Kennedy et je suis le président du BACS jusqu'à demain soir. Uh, so, thank you all for being here and for joining us from across the British Isles, from Canada and across the globe. I'm especially grateful to our presenters for offering four incredibly interesting panels that engage with the core disciplines of Canadian studies literature, language, history, and politics, and I'm especially grateful to you all, our presenters, for coming together within a relatively short time frame. I want to also acknowledge among you representatives of the High Commission of Canada here in the UK and the Délégation Générale du Québec à Londres, as well as the Canada UK Foundation. These are all very much appreciated supporters of BACS. The British Association for Canadian Studies was formed in 1975 to promote the study of Canada in the UK. There are two chief ways we do this, through our journal, the British Journal of Canadian Studies, and through the organization of our annual conference. The journal under our current stewardship of uh, Professor Maeve Conrick hasn't missed a beat in publishing recent issues through this past year. So we were determined to host an occasion, albeit smaller than our usual annual conference, that would bring together our members and supporters here and the British Isles, in Canada and elsewhere. And we are just delighted that you're able to join us. I want to just express special thanks to my co-organizers, Tony McCulloch and uh, Ellie Bird, and especially to Christina and Glenn at the, the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network for enthusiastically agreeing to support our event. It now gives me great pleasure to hand over uh, to my academic neighbour um, here in Scotland. I'm at the, the University of, uh, of Edinburgh. Professor Faye Hamill is at the University of Glasgow. And I want to say a special thanks to Faye and our pal panellists, Jen and Alex, who were early supporters of this mini conference. And we're very grateful to you all and very much look forward to your panel. So over to you, Christina, and then Faye, I think, is that how we're doing it? Sure, thanks James. And uh, yeah, we're going to get uh, started with uh, session one of today's conference uh, with a panel on transnational literature and print. Chairing this panel is Faye Hamill, who's uh, with the University of Glasgow, and I believe James has already mentioned that. So we'll pass things over to you, Faye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina and Jimmy and everybody for all of these welcomes and introductions. Um, we were supposed to have three speakers on this panel. Um, we've only got two now, as one speaker, Rachel Alexander, was unfortunately unavailable, but she's very sad not to be here. Uh, but the panel will be no less superb because we have two wonderful speakers and their papers actually fit together beautifully. So we had proposed it for last year for the real life conference um, and uh, everybody's been working further on their research since then. So now it's even better. So the topic is um, about transnationalism, and we're looking at the way that literary and periodical texts construct Canadian nationhood in transnational frames. Um, and effectively, as we only have two papers now, there's a real focus on one particular author, um, Edith Eaton, who's the subject of quite a lot of new research at the moment. Um, and she's an ideal case study, I think, because her work illuminates a lot of broader themes, not just around transnationalism, but also mobility and hybridity <clears throat> um, and issues of print and periodical culture. Um, so I'm going to um, introduce Alexandra Ablitzhauser first, um, and then she'll be giving her paper, and then I'll be introducing Jen Lu, and then we'll be having the Q&A, which is a shared discussion um, between the two speakers and the whole audience. So um, to begin with Alexandra, um, she also is at the University of Glasgow and she's a PhD candidate. Her title, thesis title is The Hearth of Reform, Social Issues and Emotions in Canadian Women's Writing, 1880 to 1914. She's also an associate researcher at the DFG Graduate School of Albert Ludwig's University in Freiburg in Germany. And in addition to that, she's participating in the Hunterian Associates Program at Glasgow's Hunterian Museum um, with a project on native North American artifacts. So I'll hand over to Alexandra now, and I know 
the title of her paper has already been circulated along with an abstract, so I'll leave her to introduce the topic herself. Thank you very much, Faye. And thank you very much to the organizers for organizing this event today. I'm just going to share my screen. Bear with me. Okay. So you should be able to see uh, my screen now. I hope so. If not, please let me know. Okay. Looks good. Thank you. Um, so yeah, my talk today will focus on Edith Mott Eaton and performative nationality. Um, before I start, a content warning that this talk will include references to racism. Edith Eaton, of part Chinese and part English parentage, pursued a successful career in several locations in North America in the late 19th and early 20th century. Eaton was born in 1865 in England. In her early childhood, her family moved to the United States and then to Canada, where she died in 1914. Eaton worked as a writer and journalist for different periodicals in Canada, Jamaica, and the United States. In the US and Canada, her work was published, for example, in the Canadian Dominion Illustrated, Land of Sunshine, The Independent, The Montreal Daily Witness, and The Montreal Daily Star. Besides writing for periodicals, she also published a short story collection for adults and children in 1912 with the title Mrs. Spring Fragrance. And you can see the cover of this collection on this slide. Eaton often wrote in support of the Chinese North American population. She assumed a Chinese American persona and often published, especially in later years, under the pen name Susan Farr. According to Chen Yu, Eaton's pen name is rooted in one of the languages spoken in China. Suisin Far can be literally translated as waterborne flower, a nickname for Narcissus in Cantonese. Thus, Eaton's transnational life and career defies a clear national affiliation, and Eaton has been claimed both as an Asian American as well as an Asian Canadian writer. Eaton is generally known for her stories and essays on Chinese North American life and uh, much of her earlier printing has been republished and collected by Eaton scholar Mary Chapman in this book, Becoming Serious and Far, where you can see the picture, the cover of the picture here. However, Chapman has also unearthed stories where Eaton wrote from different non-Chinese perspectives. While many of her texts voice a diasporic Chinese perspective or are assigned Serious and Far, others play a surprising range of viewpoints, including those of Native American women, U.S. imperial adventurers, Philippine governors, self-supporting new women stenographers, and Japanese, Persian, and Arab children. One such story is The Alaska Widow, originally published in The Bohemian in 1909. According to Chapman, the story features a Seattle stenographer who divorces her husband on the wedding day when she discovers that he had abandoned a Native American Alaska woman and their mixed-race child at the end of the Alaskan gold rush. He later dies in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War. In this paper, however, I will focus on Eaton's Chinese North American stories and essays. Indeed, her Chinese writings offer fascinating insights into her deconstruction of European North American prejudice against non-white people. Eaton wrote sympathetically about Chinese North American life at a time that was heavily characterized by anti-Chinese sentiment in North America. And to illustrate this, I have brought uh, two illustrations. On the right-hand side, you can see an illustration that shows quite eloquently that white immigration was you know, openly invited into North America, where so-called Oriental immigration, which included Chinese immigration, was actively barred. And on the left-hand side, you see a photo of an article that was published in the French-Canadian newspaper La Presse in 1898 with the title Les Chinois en danger social, the Chinese a societal danger, to illustrate that anti-Chinese sentiment was not only rife in the Anglophone world, but also in the Francophone world. Canada and the United States passed similar anti-Chinese laws. The aim of these laws was first to prevent Chinese immigration and then to stop it completely. The US passed respective acts in 1875 and in 1882. In 1885, the Canadian government passed the Chinese Immigration Act that introduced a head tax of $50 for each Chinese immigrant. The tax was rapidly increased in subsequent years to $100 per head in 1900 and then to $500 per head in 1903. 
1923, the Canadian government passed a new law that is known as the Chinese Exclusion Act. This new act stopped all Chinese immigration to Canada. It was only completely abolished in 1967. Due to anti-Chinese legislation, the Chinese could, not, could often not claim US American or Canadian citizenship and were thus excluded from an official and legal US American or Canadian membership, or in other words, nationality, until the 1940s. In the context of late 19th and early 20th century Canada, a distinction between the terms nationality, race and citizenship is not always clear when talking about the legal and societal status of Chinese Canadians. Nationality and citizenship are sometimes used synonymously as are the terms nationality and race. In this paper, I will use the term nationality and national as both in the senses of national origin and identity, as well as for citizen and citizenship. I argue that nationality can be obtained through external identification, so through someone else, as well as through internal identification through oneself. In the 19th century, the identification of Chinese can thus refer to as China as the home country, as well as to Chinese heritage. The designations Chinese American and Chinese Canadian can denote the identification with both the Chinese heritage as well as with the US or Canada's current countries of residence or the identification of US American or Canadian culture, language, society, institutions, etc. Furthermore, Canadian citizenship is a fairly recent legal status and was only introduced after the Second World War. Before 1947, Canada was part of the British Empire and there existed no such thing as citizenship. As Derek Heater notes, Westminster passed legis legislation that identified everyone born in the empire as a British subject only in 1914. In the 19th century, Canada constructed itself as a notion of and for white people only. Daniel Coleman notes that whiteness has been naturalized as the norm for English Canadian cultural identity. In other words, English Canadian as well as French Canadian identity was available to European or white people, but excluded non-European or non-white people. I will now turn to my reading of Eaton's writing and examine how Eaton challenges the principles on which nationality was based. I hope to demonstrate how Eaton uses effective strategies to demonstrate the limitations and restrictions of nationality. Furthermore, I will explore how Eaton uses emotion descriptions to manipulate the reader to adopt a sympathetic attitude towards Chinese North Americans. In her writings, Eaton confronts and deconstructs anti-Chinese prejudices. Chinese immigrants were perceived as a threat to the Euro-Canadian labor market. It depicted them as putting Euro-Canadians out of work in addition, the Chinese were often viewed as immoral and linked to prostitution, gambling, and homosexuality. In the article, A Plea for the Chinaman, a correspondence argument in his favor, published on September 24, 1896, in the Montreal Daily Star, Eaton responds to Euro-Canadian anxieties towards the dangerous Chinese. The presence of the Chinaman does not affect the material interests of this country, for he is a good and steady workman and has helped and is still helping to build our railways, mine our ores, and in various branches of agriculture and manufacturing is providing a source of wealth to those who employ him. He does good to our laboring class for he acts as an incentive to them to be industrious and honest. Eaton demonstrates that the Chinese contribute in fact to Canada's wealth. In addition, she highlights the exemplary character of the Chinese as industrious and honest. She even presents them as setting an example for the Canadian working class. In fact, it is Chinese immigrants that move the nation forward and support Canada's progress and not the Canadian working class. Indirectly, Eaton questions the grounds for Chinese exclusion from Canadian citizenship, considering that the Chinese participate in the construction, development and progress of the Canadian nation. Eaton effectively turns the prejudice around and confronts Canadian laborers with their own weaknesses that have been attributed so far to the Chinese community. In a similar way, Eaton returns the prejudice of immorality. Now as to the charges of immorality brought against the Chinese. There are over 500 Chinamen in Montreal, besides a transient population, 
And I've never heard during residency here of many years of any one of these Chinese being accused of saying or doing that which was immoral in the sense in which I understand the word immoral. It is true. Some of the Chinamen who have been contaminated by white men and American lawyers become swindlers and perjurers and help the contaminators who are just like leeches to bleed the poor Chinese laborers who are desirous of passing into the States. Whereas the Chinese are presented as virtuous, Eaton argues that the influence of white corrupted people corrupts the Chinese community. In her short story collection, Mrs. Spring Fragrance, published in 1912, includes several short stories that display anti-Western or at least Western critical discourses. The story of one white woman who married a Chinese describes the abusive and neglectful behavior of the protagonist's white husband towards his white wife. The white husband's behavior is contrasted by the supportive and loving behavior of Minnie's second husband, who is Chinese, and which is told in the sequel story, Her Chinese Husband. Similarly, in the story In the Land of the Free, James Clancy, a white American, financially exploits and profits from the desperation of a Chinese couple to liberate their baby son. The baby boy is in detention because his parents did not have the necessary papers for him when returning to America. Beside undermining European North American superiority, these stories also introduce the Chinese characters experiencing complex emotions. Questions of national and ethnic belonging are often accompanied by strong emotions. This becomes apparent, for example, in Sui Sinfa's descriptions of meeting Chinese other than her mother for the first time when living in New York. Oh, sorry, I have slipped. Um, in her autobiographical essay, Lease on the Mental Portfolio of an Eurasian, published in the American periodical The Independent in 1909, Eaton, writing as Sui Sinfar, reflects upon the opposition between the stereotypical perception of the Chinese as unfeeling and her own emotional experience. I have come from a race on my mother's side, which is said to be the most stolid and insensible to feeling of all races. Yet I look back over the years and see myself keenly alive to every shade of sorrow and suffering that it is almost a pain to live. And all the while the question of nationality perplexes my little brain. Why are we what we are? I and my brothers and sisters. Why did God make us to be hooted and stared at? Papa is English, Mama is Chinese. Why couldn't we have been either one thing or the other? Sui Sinfar's reflections highlight the discrimination and exclusion, racism and xenophobia she experiences as a child and as an adult from both Europeans, European Americans and Chinese. As in her journalistic work, Sui Sinfar picks up a stereotype of Chinese people and overturns it in this passage. She deconstructs the assumption that Chinese people are stolid and insensible to feeling in highlighting her own heightened alertness of affect, both emotionally as well as intellectually, as she's keenly alive to every shade of sorrow and suffering. Sui Sinfar's emotional experience challenges the categorization of the Chinese as being unfeeling and insensible and asks ultimately the question to whom Sui Sinfar belongs, the Chinese or the Europeans or someone else? Questions of national and ethnic belonging are often accompanied by strong emotions. This becomes apparent, for example, in Sui Sinfar's descriptions of meeting Chinese other than her mother for the first time when living in New York. We pass a Chinese store, the door of which is open. Look, says Charlie, those men in there are Chinese. Eagerly, I gaze into the low, long room. With the exception of my mother, who is English bred with English ways and manner of dress, I have never seen a Chinese person. The two men within the store, uncut specimens of their race, dressed in working blouses and pantaloons with cues hanging down their backs. I recoil with a sense of shock. Oh, Charlie, I cry, are we like that? Well, we're Chinese and they're Chinese too, so we must be, returns my seven-year-old brother. Sui Sin Far has incorporated and embodies the Euro-American prejudices against the Chinese. She is shocked and her body physically moves away from the Chinese men. It demonstrates that she has identified until now as English instead of Chinese during her childhood. Although her mother is of Chinese origin, Sui Sin Far has always viewed her as being English 
The identification of her mother as English again challenges the foundation on which the concept of Englishness and English nationality rests. For Sui Sin Far, Englishness is equated with the adoption of manners and a specific clothing style. Nationality appears thus as a performance that can be adopted through specific clothes or acting. Likewise, Eaton highlights the artificial and performative nature of nationality in the article Chinamen with German Wives, published on December 13, 1895 in the Montreal Daily Star. In this article, Eaton describes the story of Li Sing and his German wife who are leaving Canada to go back to China. Li Sing's wife is well integrated in the Chinese community. She lives in the Chinese neighborhood in Montreal. She wears Chinese clothes and eats Chinese food. However, when she boards the ship to China, she is not allowed to stay in the accommodation for Chinese women. The steamship company would not consent to such an arrangement, as they said they could not allow European women to mix up with the Chinese female passengers. Mrs. Li Sing, who was then wearing American dress, wisely considered that if she were wearing the costume she had worn with in China, the company would not look upon her as European. She therefore retired, made a change, and appearing again before the ship's officer said, see, I am a China woman now. Her wish was gratified. The Chinese nationality or the identification as Chinese is realized here through a simple change of clothing. Thus, Eaton depicts in this article, national identity as a costume, both in the sense of a specific clothing style and of a set of clothes worn by an actor for a specific role. National identity thus becomes a role that is performed in the theater of the world, a construct in which people can transform themselves into. Although nationality is presented as highly artificial and performative, it is nevertheless not attainable to everyone. The article, born a Britisher, but $50 is a tax on him as a Chinaman, published on October 27 in 1896 in the Montreal Daily Witness illustrates the exclusion and discrimination of Yen Moi by both the Chinese and the Euro-Canadians. Although Yen Moi was born in Australia to English parents, he is treated as Chinese from the Canadian government. Yen Moi grew up in China, adopted the Chinese language as his mother language and wears Chinese clothes. Thus, he has to pay the Chinese head tax of $50. At the same time, the other Chinese immigrants do not identify him as Chinese and thus do not accept him as one of them. Although Yen Moi acts like a Chinese and identifies as Chinese, his physical appearance marks him as white. Eaton notes that he is identified as an albino. He exposes features, features considered to be of English heritage, such as his white skin and his English facial features. He has a native costume. He has the language. He has Chinese habits of thought, but the Chinese will have none of him. He stood apart. He was silent under the sneers. He trembled with doubt and helplessness and fear. It was pathetic. Yen Moi is lost between the two nationalities, the British one and the Chinese one, as he is not accepted into either category. This exclusion and isolation acted by both the Chinese and the Canadian government has physical and emotional effects for Yen Moi. He is trembling because of doubts and anxieties. As readers, we feel his vulnerability and his isolation in the situation. Through the description of Yen Moi's feelings, Eaton manipulates his reader to feel the same feelings. The physical, bodily experience of Yen Moi is transferred upon the reader through the body of the text. Through the consumption of the text, Eaton evokes sympathy in the reader. She also demonstrates the fragility and instability of the concept of nationality in the sense of citizenship. In Yen Moi's case, the Canadian government identifies him as Chinese, not British, but the Chinese perceive him as British and not Chinese. Thus, nationality does not only depend on the individual's internal identification, but more importantly, on the acceptance and identification of external forces. Finally, Eaton introduces a new form of identity that can be understood as both transnational as well as post-national. At the end of her autobiographical essay, Leaves, she refused to identify with either the European or the Chinese nationality. After all, I have no nationality and am not anxious to claim any. Individuality 
is more than nationality. You are you and I am I, says Confucius. I give my right hand to the Occidentals and my left to the, to the Orientals, hoping that between them, they will not utterly destroy the insignificant connecting link. And that's all. So we send far chooses instead to identify as someone in between or moving beyond. In this sense, Sui Sinfar's identity becomes both transnational and postnational. As transnational, it moves beyond the limitations of both the European and the Chinese nationalities. As postnational, it highlights that identity is no longer defined by citizenship, but by feelings of cultural belonging of one's country of residence or one's country of origin. Belonging is then no, long, no longer defined exclusively by one's country of residence or one's country of origin, but by one's cultural and emotional identifications. In conclusion, Eaton deconstructs European North American prejudice against Chinese people in presenting Chinese characters experiencing complex emotions. She also challenges European North American superiority in presenting the immoral and unfeeling behavior of Euro-Canadians and Euro-Americans. In addition, Eaton's writings reveal the limitations and the inadequacy of the definition of nationality based on political entities, such as the nation state. Nationality appears as an artificial and performative construct that people can transform into or perform through specific clothes, makeup and behavior. Furthermore, Eaton illuminates the instability and fragility of nationality as it always depends on external approval, for instance, of governments or other community members who have to claim you back. Instead of grounding nationality on political entities such as nation states, Eaton proposes trans and post-national identities that are defined on one's cultural and emotional identifications. Thank you very much. Um, am I coming back in now? Go ahead, Beth. Yeah, go ahead. No. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alexandra. I thought that was wonderful. I'm sure everybody else did as well. Um, so please save up your questions and we'll listen first to um, the second paper by Dr. Zhen Liu, who is a lecturer in the School of Foreign Languages and Literature at Shandong University in China. And she got her PhD in 2016 from the University of Strathclyde, um, which I think her thesis has now just been published as a book. Um, and the title is A Liberating Inheritance, Chinese Canadian and Japanese Canadian Literature, 1970s to 2000s. And her other work is published or forthcoming in journals, including British Journal of Canadian Studies, which was obviously the first one that I recommended to her. Um, Journal of Commonwealth Literature and Rice Paper. Um, so let me hand over now to um, Jen to present your paper. Okay. In 1904, Edith Eaton undertook one of her transcontinental trips, traveling from Los Angeles to Montreal and back. Had we had a chance to be in the same carriage and observe her, we would be intrigued by the touch of mischief at the corner of Our Lady's mouth who, in her own words, was making my way as a Chinaman. As could be deduced from her letter to Robert Underwood Johnson, associate editor at um, Century Magazine dated 24th uh, December 1903, Eaton's transcontinental journey was in part to fulfill a contract with the CPR so that she could, as she expressed in her biographical article, leaves from the mental portfolio of a, a Eurasian, afford a trip to the Far East. So I'm leaving here early in January and will be in Seattle until sometime in February. When I reached my home in Montreal, Canada, I wanted to make arrangements with some railway to give me a trip to China and Japan. I will work my way. If I have the opportunity by writing letters for some paper, I hope I may be able to go although my journey will not be with the object of visiting the tombs of my ancestors, hoping that you will be interested in my sketch. 
The resulting work is 15 installments of a travel log written in the voice of a Chinese mail merchant, Wen Xing, in the form of letters to the editor pub published at Los Angeles Express. On this trip, Eaton's mission, mission is threefold, to dismantle racial stereotypes against the Chinese, to promote her homeland Canada to, to Americans, and to promote the railway services. Indeed, if a Chinese man could feel comfortable and at ease on the trains, the services could be well trusted. Moreover, most of the earliest Chinese immigrants went to North America as indentured laborers to build railways. A Chinese person enjoyed in first-class railway service and writing about it, therefore, challenges prevalent, uh, prevalent in, in, impressions about the Chinese at that time. In these letters, Eaton took on another person's voice and identity, and by doing so, she was able to experiment with a special authorial identity and position, a different writing style, and indeed, a set of more liberating identity politics. I argue that her visual and identity politics as manifested in these travelogues were well ahead of her time. She accurately targeted binarism, which has a work behind racism. Within the binary system, the one always puts the other in an oppositional position whilst enjoying the center and power to control, exploit, and even vanquish the other. The other is rendered both obscure and definite. Obscure in that they are flattened into a faceless group, definite as they are set apart from the one. Her Winston establishes relaxed relationships with people she meets along the trip. We might describe this as between one and another instead of uh, in the more intense and oppositional terms of between one and the other. In doing so, people of different races are not seen as of one singular and definite type, but individuals of various kinds. Thus, the character of Winston models models Eaton's ideas about an ideal society which is tolerant and free, where individuals are regarded and valued according to their individual characters instead of according to racial or national categories. With the publication of Becoming uh, Sui Sing Far, Early Fiction Journalism and Travel Writing by Edith Maud Eaton, uh, Editor Mary Chapman brought back into print 71 pieces Eaton's lost works. Especially, Chapman has made available for the first time in book form the complete collection of the Winston travelogue. I argue that the discussion of Eaton's travel writing, which in many ways proves to be unique in her uh, oeuvre, is of uh, great significance. The many presumptions held by contemporary researchers on Eaton prior to the unearthed works are challenged. For example, researchers used to compare her with her sister Winifred Eaton and concluded that she de deployed less performativity in her writing. But the travel log shows that Eaton had not hesitated from performing when it served her goal of dismantling racism. Before embarking on this discussion, I will introduce the travel logs briefly. Wen Xing, an in in immigrant Chinese merchant, who owns a business in Los Angeles, promised the ex Express to write a series of articles in his own untrammeled style, telling of his travels. The whole travel plan is generated on the spur of the moment, stimulated by a letter from his cousin. My cousin in Montreal write me a very long letter. They planted good things I love. He say, come see me, this city is very fancy. You take a railway car or steamboat all the way to San Francisco. Then you took a railway car or steamer all the way to Vancouver. Just what you please. Vancouver, Canadian city up, up, up north. When you get there, you take one big train named Canadian Pacific Railway train, Imperial Limited. That train fly fast with you to me. Four day, four night go by. You see one big fun building. Same Emperor China, uh, China Palace that Canadian railway, uh, uh, Pacific Railway Station, Montreal, then you see me. The cousin outlines a trans uh, continental trip with ease and precision, which shows him to be knowledgeable and experienced about such trips. 
It turns out that Wen Sing has a grander plan in mind and takes the opportunity to pay visit to many other cousins along the railways in both the US and Canada. At the time, most people in Chinese Chinese communities were railway workers whose effort made uh, transcontinental trips possible and enjoyable. But when the projects were completed, people chose to forget about the Chinese laborers whilst, whilst enjoying the enhanced mobility and the convenience. Eaten by given voice to the Chinese person claims the rightful recognition for the Chinese while challenges the stereotypical idea that the Chinese could only work behind the scenes and they don't enjoy modernity or public services. What Wen Xin could have expected on his trip across North America was severe racial discrimination, riots rampaged Chinatowns in major cities, and both America and Canada had passed a, a series of laws imposing an ever-mounting head tax and a, um, culminating with the Chinese Exclusion Acts. In fact, it may be expected that Wen Xin should encounter some level of unpleasant treatment, such as not allowed to travel in the same carriage with white people, since racial segregation was in place at that time. However, Wen Xin does not show any hesitation in taking a cross-continental journey. Eaton makes it seem natural that Wen Xin should have an enjoyable trip and fulfill his purposes. The strategy of normalization put Wen Xin on an equal footing with his fellow travelers, rather than a racial other who is usually portrayed as inferior in the writings at the turn of the 20th century. Wen Xin does not, though, follow the cousin's proposed itinerary, but makes spontaneous decisions according to uh, travel condition, conditions or when he feels like staying longer at one place. He, does, he starts in Los Angeles on 1st January 1904, uh, here, <laughs> taking the South Pacific train to San Francisco, where he, he changes into the steamer uh, Coronado and uh, goes up to Seattle. From Seattle, I'm oh, sorry, here, Seattle. Sorry, I was wrong. So Los Angeles and uh, um, uh, San Francisco and uh, uh, then Seattle. So uh, uh, from Seattle, uh, Winston enters Canada and makes stop at uh, Vancouver. He then journeys east by Canadian Pacific Railway across the continent until he arrives in Montreal for the Chinese New Year on 19th February. After extended stay of uh, two months, probably because Eaton is very much attached to the place where she grew up, Winston then makes his way to New York on 20th May by using the uh, Delaware and the Hudson Railway to go to Albany and from Albany to New York by the New York Central Road. After that, Winston travels west and then south to San Francisco and back to where she, he starts in Los Angeles. Perhaps it is to fulfill the commitment to the railway services that Eaton notes down the trajectory and the connections carefully. Contrary to what the cousin predicts to be a four day, four night trip, it takes Winston almost seven months to complete his journeys. In each installment, installment when he is en route, Winston observes his immediate environment in the train or the scenery out of the window and often strikes up conversations with his fellow travelers in an easy and a friendly manner. When he stays at a place for some time, he then has time to make observations about the city, make comparisons or talk about Chinese customs and uh, culture. As we can see, Wednesday's des destinations, as random as they may seem, are rationalized by his calling upon his cousins. This put the Chinese communities on the North American map, making the presence of a Chinese community actual. These cousins represent Chinese immigrants of various status, such as a cousin who owns a big cigar factory in San Francisco and another who washes gold in the Fraser River but most of them are successful merchants. Moreover, by referring to cousins, not immediate relatives, Eaton also hints that human relationship at large should be like one family, as she wished. Only when the whole world becomes as one family will human beings be able to see clearly and hear distinctly. More specifically, it will be best that the interpersonal relationship should be like those between cousins, related enough to show hospitality and respect, 
but loose enough not to form ex uh, exclusive units. Eaton developed a gussy uh, uh, communist theory in the travelogue. Um, when I see the real uh, big railway across the continent and the big steamer that go to China for my countrymen to see, I feel that the people of China and the people of all beneath this sky are as one great family. Here, Eaton sees modern facilities promising to bring forward a time when all the countries become more closely linked and a socialist utopia instead of exclusion and conflicts lies ahead. In the first letter, Wen Xing demonstrates his non-apologetic attitude, not letting people taking him as cultural translator or cultural informant, but as an individual, a fellow traveler whose peace should not should be respected. Under the uh, subtitle of a lady, she had she have no sense. Wen Xing notes down. One day, have have a, a nice full moon face look at me, Mister Chinaman. Won't you please tell me all about Confucius? I said to I say to her, I now teacher, I now scholar, I businessman. Confucius to Chinaman, same as Jesus to white man. I now go to white businessman and ask him to tell me all about Jesus, for he now know. I go to American preacher to know all about your sage Jesus. So you not a Chinese teacher and you got Chinese teacher and scholar to know about Confucius. Though he seem, seems a bit blunt in his manners, especially in answering a polite and a curious lady, Winston's rationale is nonetheless irreproachable, and this emphasizes the importance of the source of cultural information. One should not take it for granted that a person from a culture is the official spokesperson for that culture as his own interpretation, framed by his understanding and personal experience, may pass on false information. Meanwhile, if one is really interested to know, one should evaluate the information sources and make real efforts in trying to get trustworthy resources, all the time remembering that one version can never tell the whole truth. Importantly, Eaton's non-compliant attitude is not only ahead of her time, but surpasses that of many contemporary Asian North American writers who often write with a celebratory uh, tone in one of the earliest monographs in the field, Asian American literature, Ellen Kim calls many of these writers ambassadors of goodwill. In her other works, Eaton had spoken directly against racism, racism against the Chinese immigrants in North America. Uh, Amy Lin observes, Eaton's response to racism was frontal assault, direct and confrontational. However, in Winston's travelogues, Eden adopted a different strategy by not letting her avatar, Wen Xing, feel obli obligated to defend his position or act as a cultural ambassador. E Eden envisions a future for Chinese Americans in which they could simply be what they are and enjoy the possibilities of modern mobility and technology as white Americans do. I argue that by carefully choosing her subject position and writing techniques, Eaton consciously experimented with language, style, and modes of political assertion in order to establish a culture writing that is appealing whilst returning a non-compromising stance. In Vancouver, Winston meets an Irishman for the first time. Winston's initial reaction is a bit pe 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 peculiar. He copies down his fellow traveler's notes word by word. I see a man write with a pencil in a book. He say we come through Washington, that the very fertile country for cabbages and grass and timber, and it rain all the time in winter and very fine in summer, and that it's so green and fresh that he thought he back again in the Emerald Isle. The Irishman's travelogue is precise, clear, and uh, professional, clearly following a tradition established by co the colonizers who traveled in colonies assessing the new world for agricultural and inhabitation possibilities. Though his notes seem to be neutral, objective, in the scientific, they are also political, helping the colonizer to assess their superiority and ownership of the land. As average immigrants were also discriminated within the white hierarchy in North America, Eaton shows how cultural dominance takes place without the subject's awareness as they internalize the values.
It mocks a professional travel uh, travel writer who would stay up all night and note down what he sees in evaluative words when they uh, when they uh, travel past Lake Superior. Uh, when things excitement is easy to see. One time we see big part of lake shining like the best glass. I say to the Irishman, I'm very glad to behold what I hear is the biggest lake in the world. He say very grand country, fine mining region. By comparing the two styles of uh, travel writing, Eaton gen uh, gently guides her readers to prefer the, the more personal and imaginative description of landscape over the Irishman's concise but a utility oriented evaluative conclusions. On noticing that Winston had copied exactly what he had written, the Irishman said, Oh, you must not copy what I write. Just put down what you think yourself. I say, Oh, that's all right. I think same as you. He say, Then you must be an Irishman. And I tell him that I think Chinamen be all kind of men in the States. He say, But you not be in the States. It's in the States. Very soon you'll be in Canada. We just come to Suma, but the borderline. I changed my pin here. The Irishman holds that only people who belong to the same nation can think in the same way. Well, Vincent points out that people of one nationality could be very diverse and, uh, uh, and that conversely, the difference between two individuals of different nations may not be very uh, significant. The Irishman, as he is a, a, a citizen of the British Empire, can, co uh, can cross borders easily. In the settlers' countries such as the US and Canada, the line for him is non-existent, as he can pass freely. More importantly, he can choose to represent either country as easily as changing a pin. His personal ceremony also signifies that for a British subject, one does not need to change or prove anything when crossing from a, a current to a former part of the empire, whereas for the Chinese, it is different. And, uh, and to, to serve as a conclusion, because I think I, I took too much time, I'll, I'll just uh, stop here. So as you say, very importantly, though she was not actually the person who coined the term Chinese American, Eaton reaffirms it. In several of the letters, notably the last ones, there is a subheading after the title of the letters. Importantly, in the 13th letter, the words Chinese American are used to designate Chinese people living in America. Eaton claimed American identity for the people of Chinese heritage in the US. The hyphenated identity has enabled enormous progress in race-based identity politics for non-whites in North America, which allows the overseas Chinese to claim her uh, citizenship status as Americans. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to, uh, to our uh, session one presenters, uh, Alexandra and Chen. Uh, we are now ready to begin taking questions from our audience. So if anybody um, in our Zoom meeting has questions, then you can uh, type those into a message either to Glenn or to myself. You can also type them to Faye, who is the uh, the chair. Um, otherwise, if uh, if you're familiar with Zoom, there is an option at the bottom there. That if you take your cursor to the bottom of the screen, there's a button called Reactions. If you click on that button, there's an option to raise your virtual hand, and I'll be monitor monitoring uh, to see if anyone has a raised hand, and then we can. Uh, we can let you ask your, your question. Um. Tony, James, or uh, Faye, um, you guys are co-hosts with me. So if you have a question in advance, um, we could start with with any of you as well. Yeah, I, I, uh, oh, sorry. I've got a question. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah. 
I enjoyed uh, the panel very much, and I was interested in um, the uh, British background uh, of uh, Edith Eaton. I understand she, she left Britain very early, didn't she? Uh, and so presumably the image that comes through in her writings, whether it's to do with um, racism in Canada or anything else, it is more from her family, from the people she met in Canada or America. I mean, she had very little to build on, I think, from being in Britain itself. I, I didn't she leave didn't her family leave Britain when she was uh, a baby? Um, and then I think they went back to England and then they traveled again when she was about seven years old. So I just wonder how, in terms of her Britishness, as it were, although she's a British Canadian, uh, British Chinese background, um, where, where is her, her kind of British view coming from? That's to either panelist. If you understand my question. Um, um, well, I, I'm actually just thinking because, well, we usually like, a, well, already like a Canada and a, and uh, America have been fighting for, you know, <laughs> they, 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 they've been like uh, claiming like uh, Edith as like a uh, Chinese Canadian or Chinese American. I never thought about like, uh, you know, the, the British part of, uh, of her identity, but obviously her father is British, right? So I think, um, he, he, she must have like a benefit from the upbringing of her uh, her father. But then I was have all. Hmm, I think they are kind of a banished from Britain. I, from what I I heard, like uh, what I I read, it's like uh, the family cannot accept her mother, so like uh, the father are not like uh, accepted by the family, so they he had to take uh, Eden along with two or three other children to, to go to uh, New York and then settled in Montreal. So I, I think, well, I'm sorry, I, I really no, don't no. get, never answer to this. No. She does in, in both of your papers, she refers to the English, for example, and their manners and their dress, and there's a certain you know, science of being English or British. So she's obviously got an image of Britishness or Englishness. So I'm just asking where you think she's getting that from. I think um, it's most like in my research, um, I take this information mostly from our autobiographical essay, uh, Lee's Fundamental Portfolio. Um, where I think there's a section when they are back in England and she's a uh, where, when she's a child and um, she has a nanny who tells other nannies that she's of Chinese descent and then just kind of you know they look at her and like point her out and this is a very negative experience for for her for for Eton. Um, so it's like one part that is kind of set in England in this essay, but of course we don't know for sure whether she experienced that herself explicitly or whether this is the persona she creates. Um, in in this essay under the, the pen name Sue is in far um, and the Englishness um, comes I guess both from her father's side as well as from her mother's side I mean Mary Chapman would have now more information on her mother's biography um, so I think like really broadly um, her mother I think was kind of adopted and then grew up in England as well and she is kind of depicted as a very westernized a Chinese woman or kind of English woman as as Sui Sin Far right so said, you know she could wears English clothes and has like English behavior whatever that is was kind of you know acts like as a Victorian lady a middle class lady basically okay. we have another question from uh, from our audience here Mark Menenko 
We're going to unmute you and turn your camera on. All good, Mark. All right. I'm just uh, wondering uh, a couple, couple of points is if she was working as a nanny, what socioeconomic status did her family occupy then? And whether that influenced her writing. And the second question to it is, uh, does she refer to women or of uh, other ethnic groups? that she came across in her studies other than just uh, of Chinese background. So those two questions. Um, I popped in and uh, so she didn't work as a nanny but as a journalist and writer. So the experience I refer to was when Eaton was a child and had a nanny, Eaton herself worked as a stenographer and a journalist. Um, but regarding her socioeconomic background, that's really interesting because um, I think when her family moved to North America, they were rather poor and the children had, um, you know, when they could, had to work and support the family as well. And I think Eaton, through her work as a journalist and stenographer, also supported the family financially. Um, so... Um, I'm not quite, I don't, I'm not very knowledgeable about her, her parents' backgrounds. Um, so, I, but I would say that her parents came, or her father came more from a middle-class background, but for various reasons, when they had to leave England and, and moved to, to North America, they were rather poor and kind of probably moved between classes or socioeconomic backgrounds. And then this, any comment on the second part about uh, does she refer to any other uh, or women of any other ethnic backgrounds or any other ethnic backgrounds that are covered in her uh, in her work? Um, Mary Chapman mentions this. Uh, the quote I, I know used in my presentation um, that she, she did write about other um, communities or adopted other voices, like, for example, in the story, The Alaska Widow, um, she talks about a white American woman from Seattle and uh, a native Alaska woman appears as well, but she, she doesn't speak. So there are other voices as well. Um, but it's more a question of finding those writings and attributing them to Edith Eaton. Um, so I'd say there probably are there. Those stories or those texts are not necessarily like they haven't found their way yet to to us and have read or contributed to her. All right, thank you very much. I have a question from uh, Faye Hamill. Go ahead, Faye. Sure, um, I was trying to think of a real question that I've never actually asked you before in our various conversations about this author. Um, but I actually remember now that um, the question of money has struck me a few times when thinking about both of your work on um, Eaton. And I noticed, Jen, that you said how she was sponsored by the railway company and she had to promote the um, railway through her travel writing. And I was specifically wondering how that influences the way the pieces are written um, and the way that she describes the actual journey. But more broadly, I think, in relation to both your papers, I'm just thinking about how Eaton made her money um, and about commercial popularity. And I think some of the things that you've suggested in terms of her representations of race and hybridity and so on um, could have been, you know, specifically oriented towards particular markets and readerships and perhaps either toned down or in some other cases made a bit more direct um, according to whether or not this was a piece that was written to make money or one which was perhaps more of an opinion piece, if you like. So I'm just wondering if um, Jen initially, and then also Alex have got any comments on the, the financial aspects of these publications, or commercial, I might say. Whereas something from uh, like uh, the uh, standing of autobiographical novel, like me, a recollection like that that's by her sister like a winified and in winified's writing 
he she she always like uh, depicted like Edith as you know quite quite uh, money driven <laughs> like uh, he he she always like uh, trying to like uh, you know press all her sisters to earn more money and send back to help the family and uh, and she said that I think she is quite conscious like uh, like financially like uh, for example she uh, in, in that like a uh, uh, leaves she she already like uh, talk about like uh, she started to earn for the family by making laces when she was five years old um and then like uh, she tried to peddle her uh, her father's like drawings later and then like uh, she become a journalist and uh, and also i think she she got all kinds of small jobs i don't think she she fared as good as her like a sister winified but I think she's been trying to support herself and as well like as like sending money to uh, the, the family who which is overcrowded by some 10 surviving children and, and uh, a father who doesn't really like, uh, you know, work much and who, who, who dreams to be, you know, still an artist to support the family. And uh, I think th this contract, I think, for, for this trip, especially, I think, and also I think there must be some part of the her income coming from the Chinese uh, community or, or the, I, I, I know that's what I really want to look into. I know she has close relationship with uh, uh, like the, the, um, the, the revolutionist like a party at that time. So, and, and, uh, and she, uh, I think she, she, she knew quite, a lot of influential people, Chinese people, like uh, who, 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 like uh, who traveled in the U.S. and trying to set up their clubs and uh, uh, to overturn the the imperial like family at that time. I think she, someone said, said like uh, she even met like uh, uh, we we call Sun Zhongshan, like the <laughs> the the <laughs> well. It's all kinds of pronunciation problem. Like uh, uh, I don't know which name he goes by in in Britain. But uh, anyways, like uh, I I think because you know what intrigued me first to look into her relationship with the Chinese community was like uh, the 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 headstone, like uh, like Yi uh, Bu Wang Hua, like uh, her her something like her great uh uh her uh, the her the the writer thing to do was never to forget China, something like that. So I was thinking there must be something great, like she has been involved with uh, um, that kind of a, you know, like a, like a revolutionary, like a, like a, um, actions and uh, maybe something even more, you know, stunning that to be discovered. Yeah, and I, I was thinking about your question, like when you ask about her representation of race, um, I just compared her in my head to another Canadian writer of mixed race, Eve Pauline Johnson, who was part English, part Mohawk, and in her was a writer and performer as well. And, and uh, Pauline Johnson um, dressed as well as an Indigenous woman and then changed into clothes of an English woman. So she was playing more with those identities, whereas this, far as I know, Suis and Furrow, Edith Eaton um, refused to do that. Um, we have in, in her autobiographical essay, she writes about that someone suggested to her that she should adopt the Chinese dress and costume and you know act like a full Chinese person um, to, to become more marketable or commercial and she refuses to do so. Um, and she, also in her writing, she begins like with you know, unsigned pieces or with EE, -E, so her initials or Edith Eaton, and then uh, later adopts Sue Sinfar and other pen names. Um, and I think regarding the race, I think she's focused more on representing like Chinese North American or like Eurasian, like something that is neither Chinese nor European, but something unique that cannot clearly pin down. Um, um, yeah, and I don't, I don't feel that her opinion or her expressions like change a lot. I guess when she writes under the name Suisin Far, her pieces 
um, they become like commercial in the sense that she uses more sentimental tropes or more feelings, not necessarily to, to criticize um, the North American readership, but to, you know, to kind of evoke and, and manipulate their feelings to feel sympathy for the Chinese community. And it's less about, um, you know, calling the North Amer uh, the, 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 the European North Americans out and telling them, you know, you're doing wrong, but you should feel sympathy for those people because they are like we are, they have the same feelings, they care for their families, etc. Thanks, Alessandra. Thank you. Um, we do have a question from my colleague, Glenn. Go ahead, Glenn. Hello, uh, thank you for both your presentations. Um, I suppose this question isn't entirely surprising given the current context. Um, I guess what I, what I want to ask both of you is, um, given the context of the pandemic and increasing anti-Asian racism and violence, um, maybe how uh, your relationship to Eaton's writing has changed, uh, shifted slightly, and also maybe what we can learn um, from her writing today. Well, I think Eaton said at some point, also in that, like uh, uh, in, in the, while well, she published under the name of EE e. and to apply for the uh, Chinaman or something like that, she said something like, you know, like uh, something, I just rephrase, I cannot find it now, like something like, uh, you know, as enlightened people, like, uh, uh, we should like it. Uh, I think she said something like, uh, "Well, uh, she under she she's quite clever in like uh, you know like uh, putting them metaphorically and uh, like uh, su summarize it to summarize the racist problem into like uh, the West the, the the white people thinking the Chinese are not beautiful <laughs> they're not good looking and then she she said like isn't that like a uh, uh, beauty is just a matter of opinion, and uh, and also like uh, you know like uh, as in in in, in like uh, people with like uh, you know who in, in, inherited the uh, spirit of the enlightenment, you just should do what you what is reasonable. You should listen to you know reasons, and if we know you know, I, I mean like uh, also like uh, she attacks like a. Uh, Bannerism in uh in in what I just like uh, like I said like uh, uh the Winston uh, travel log I think you know it, it's just sometimes it's we understand the the uh, uh the the whole scheme of a racism like uh, you know put the other and try to vent out your own anger or your own fear but then as you understand it try to re react to it like with senses. That's what I think. I think Eden, Eden said that like a hundred years ago, the things didn't get any better. And it's a, you know, it's a shame. Thank you for that, Alexandra. I don't know if you have any thoughts, but if you do, just turn on your mic. Um, yes, I agree with Shen. And um, I think when reading Eden's text who are Kind of you know more than 100 years old now um it's quite shocking that we haven't moved that far further and that so much of what is like with anti-asian racism or black lives matter and all these movements just showing like how so much has not changed and how important it is to still discuss those texts and talk about them and read them and and you know put the writers forward and present them talk about them as well thank you both I appreciate that. Thank you, Alessandra and Chen. Do we have any more questions from the audience? I'm looking for a raised hand. Ah, Bart. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna unmute you there, Bart. It's all yours. Okay. Hello. Um, lovely. Well, good to be here. Thanks for the conference and thanks for the two um, papers. Wonderful. And uh, yeah, as uh, uh, both of you so very uh, topical uh, back then and maybe even more so now. Um, I'm just going to read uh, a few words, uh, a quote that I that I noted, um, and I'm just I'm going to ask you to maybe contextualize it. So I, I wrote down um, that I think 
Eaton said that, um, that a great part of the world will be Eurasian one day. Um, now we've been talking about race and about discrimination of uh, within within North America, um, uh, white versus uh, Ch Chinese, if you will. Does this reflect something different? I mean, does this reflect sort of and and you know, I mean, it, it makes me think. I mean, one reaction of mine is sort of you know some some sort of pseudo science science back back then that uh, that you know the sort of weak races will die out and the dominant ones will will uh, prevail. Um, could you comment on this, please? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I think it's very interesting quote. And um, I think it shows what I guess nowadays, as well as in the past, a lot of people do not want to acknowledge that we don't, uh, like everyone has a quite diverse background. And um, Eaton, in her writings, as well as in her autobiography essay, especially, she also focuses on, you know, Chinese Americans or like Eurasian people and how they pass for someone else like you know, Spanish or Mexican American or Japanese American, like races that were viewed more positively than Chinese Americans. Mm. Um, and I think it's also kind of a wink with the eye that you know you can not always be sure that what people are, what they tell you they are for whatever reasons. Um, and that we are that you know people's as you know, people's might be more mixed and have different backgrounds that we actually know or acknowledge. Right, okay, thank you. Um, I think I come from the background, uh, academic background of uh, like a contemporary Asian Canadian literature. So I think this quite from a different angle, I think for, for Eaton to be, you know, like a in between, to be a, a hybrid flower, a flower, actually that's her actual word, like uh -huh. a, Said he said, like, can you see those hybrid seedlings? They those are the saddest. And uh, he he said, like, uh, other people will never know that, like, uh, Alexandra just quote, like, the father cannot understand her, the mother cannot understand her. I think it's not a problem to be, you know, either a uh, British, uh, uh, English, or like a Chinese, but it, it's mm. the the, the the sad thing comes from like just an in between half and half, and she's not like taking into like one of the other group, and uh, and she said mm -hmm. like you know, she's she she's thought like quite like torn between like her metaphor of a like she's turning east and turning west, and uh, and she's mm -hmm. always like, floating, and he hope it can be the insignificant link, but I hope they they won't break. Mm -hmm. I think there is something like. A, what she can understand only as a, you know, like a, like a, you know, Eurasian. And also I, she, she said like a, she can, she only, she really identifies with those children, like a, also like a, who are also Eurasians. Like a, she thinks like, a, like a, I think she quoted one, one child saying to their, uh, saying to her like a, why, why, sh why, why should father born us? Like it's, it's so 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 like a painful to be there. I think like a, you know, I think for her, it, it's a, it's a battle, a personal battle, battle like to get reconciled with her own like a, you know difficulty. Thanks. Yeah. Just uh, yeah, and it's interesting that you say looking east and west because one could ask fairly, what about looking south? But uh, you know, I'll leave it there maybe because <laughs> James has raised his hand. Uh, so thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, super interesting. Thanks very much. Thank you, James. I just unmuted you. Oh, great. Um, I enjoyed the papers very much. That, that was a great session. Um, I mean, this is really just a riff off uh, the past few questions uh, from Bart. Great to see Bart and uh and glenn um so ultimately would you say that um the eaton is is either is an optimist when it comes to her interpretation of nationalism and this kind of essentializing element within nationalism that you know this of um, the tendency to kind of express a sameness you know the the conformity you need to be like this because in, in some of the, the, the presentations, and Alex mentioned the, this kind of performative aspect, you can, 
play around with dress, you can play around with nationality. I love that um, quote that uh, the Jen had um, with these these travel directions to get to Montreal. You know, you just kind of, you know, you continue up the the west coast and then you take a right and, and you take this long train and four days later you get off and I'm there and you know, well, you know, which seems to be quite you know, quite nationally indifferent sort of phrase that historians often use that, you know, it, it didn't, nothing to do with nationality or borders. It was just, here's how to get to where I am, you know. The, and so there was this, I don't know, am I making any sense? Would you say that, that in terms of our view about, you know, what's possible, that can, can is diversity possible um, with these pressures, with the racism of the time, with this kind of essentializing nationalism, that, that uh, um, places a primacy on whiteness. Um, is diversity possible? Is she optimistic about this or is, is, does she sort of look at the, these very real discriminatory exclusionary pressures and, and is a little pessimistic? Is, is this making sense? I don't know. So uh, is she an optimist or, or a pessimist? I think she she herself says something like, uh, you know, like uh, as she said, like uh, you know, continuing uh, Bart's like uh, quotation. She said like, uh, you know, one day there will be all Eurasians, like uh, that the world will be all Eurasians, and uh, she said I'm just a pioneer. So the pioneer like uh, is supposed to suffer or something like that. She said that herself, but she I think ultimately she's uh, um, quite optimistic about a future and think she envisioned a future like uh, when you know the, the world is uh, uh, all the world is a big family and the people will be connected to each other one way or another and especially by you know the genetic like uh, you know links i think yeah yeah i agree as well and um she herself, like, uh, she also makes this the development once she starts meeting and getting acquainted with Chinese people and, you know, frequents the Chinese community. Um, her negative perspe per per perspective or perception of the Chinese change and they become like family and uh, it becomes home for her. And she explicitly states that, you know, once you start to get to know people, um, all your prejudices they just unravel and you just like you meet on eye level and you you see the individual and then it changes and that um this is like the key for like you know to become like the world family or a whole family it's to get to know people are there any more questions from the audience today i have a, a question something i'm wondering is um I know like you've, you've analyzed some of her texts. I'm actually curious about the um, the reception of her writing in Canada. Has there been any studies about that? Or what do we know about how the general public or people reading these, you know, um, some of these periodicals or newspapers, how they, how they felt about her writing? Uh, do we know anything to that, to that effect? Um, well, one thing I know, like uh, it was quite difficult for Eaton to like just to find like newspapers that will that are willing to publish her articles, and uh, some of the resources she had were through her in-laws, like uh, her like uh, brother-in-laws, and uh, like uh, in in like like Johnson that was her her brother-in-law, like uh, she who who would really get to know her and understand her work, and I think only some very uh revolution uh what talk leftist like <laughs> like uh, uh ma magazines in the in, in the west coast uh, in in america could publish something like uh, her uh, her letters to to the editor to to the to editors and uh, i think well part of the um you know it it says a lot already like it uh, like edith was forgotten for over 60 year, years until like later, like, like scholars brought her back into attention. And I, I well, 
Well, but indeed, in her own hometown, like in Montreal, the 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 Chinese community it like erected a tomb head for her and uh, and then written on it to thank her for her like a service and help to the Chinese community. So I think well, I would I, we never I, I think a lot a lot still to be researched. Yes, I agree. And um, I, I think I've read somewhere that her uh, short story collection, Mrs. Spring Fragrance, was received rather positively. Um, but as Jen already said, like after her death, she was forgotten only unearthed in the 1980s. Um, so, you know, quite a long time afterwards. And although it's kind of not always, you know, you cannot always use a reputation as a measurement, but uh, I think in Eaton's case, at least for like European North American public, um, she was not that popular that well known um compared for example to her sister winifred that during winifred's lifetime was more successful um, but after her death was also forgotten thank you both it's interesting to be the montrealer here and wondering about how she was received um but i'm anxious to learn more and um, of course we have a, a chinese community here in montreal that dates back to the late 19th century and they're Obviously, there's been a lot of new immigration as well over the years, but there are families here that have been in Montreal for a long time, and I'm I'm kind of curious if if that uh, if her memory still lives on in any any kind of form. Anyways, thank you both for your responses. Thank you, Alexandra, Chen, and Fei uh, for uh, the first session panel um, for today. Thank you everyone for your participation, um, your comments, your questions. Um, we are going to, I think, take, yeah, we'll take a, we'll take a short break. Um, probably for yeah, the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, we will be coming back here at 1 p.m. Eastern time, that is 6 p.m. British time. Um, so please come back for session two this afternoon. Uh, join us for the Eccles lecture. Uh, Professor Robert Dunbar of the University of Edinburgh will be discussing indig Indigenous languages in Canada, addressing the challenges, righting the wrongs. So that will be at 1 p.m. Eastern time, 6 p.m. Uh, British time, and we'll see you then. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is session two of the British, British, I'm sorry, British Association for Canadian Studies uh, mini conference co-hosted by the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network. Um, our session two begins today with the Eccles Lecture. So I'm going to call upon Vax President James Kennedy to introduce today's speaker. Go ahead, James. Oh, here we go, yeah. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, thanks, Christina. Um, so I am not uh, Jean Petrovich. Uh, Jean Petrovich from the Echo Center for the for uh, American Studies at the British Library Center. Apologies, Jean was to introduce this year's lecture. However, dental surgery is the culprit. We send Jean our best wishes for a speedy recovery. Uh, Bax is very grateful to the Echo Center for sponsoring this annual lecture. The Echo Centre was founded in 1991 to promote the scholarly and creative use of the British Library's Canadian, US and Caribbean collections. It offers an extremely generous fellowship programme and runs normally a very active series of events through the year. Um, Echoes is delighted to support anyone at whatever level um, wishing to use its collection. So it's really um, it's a it's a great center to, to know about and, and to utilize. Um, so have a look at their website. So in Jean's absence, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague and chair of Celtic at the University of Edinburgh, Professor Robert Dunbar. Rob has been a staunch supporter of Canadian studies at the University of Edinburgh for many, many years now. We've participated together in many a seminar and we both teach on an undergraduate course on Canada. However, it's Rob's very considerable body of research that has led him to be chosen as this year's Eccles lecturer. Rob is a lawyer by profession and training, 
He has brought this legal expertise to the study of languages, most especially minoritized languages and the languages of indigenous peoples. This includes very considerable work on his part on the Gaelic language in Scotland and Canada. Uh, Rob's expertise has, has been drawn on by a number of international organizations, including the Council of Europe and the OSCE, as well as the Scottish and Welsh governments in the development of uh, their policy and the development of the, the Gaelic and Welsh languages, respectively. I only wish I had a few words of Gaelic to properly introduce Rob. I'm afraid it's limited to ordering coffee, which is not terribly useful for an occasion such as this. Today, Rob turns his attention to Canada's Indigenous languages, and the title of Rob's address is Indigenous Languages in Canada, Addressing the Challenges, Writing the, the Wrongs. It's a very great pleasure to pass over to, to Rob and look forward to, to your lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Jimmy, and I'd like to thank uh, you and also the organizers and the association for doing me the great honor of inviting me to give this year's Eccles Lecture. Um, it came as a surprise and um, uh, a daunting task, but um, one that I'm very honored to, to take up. Um, uh, so thank you very much, and thank you to the participants for participating in um, this year's conference. Uh, we're all learning to deal with a much different set of circumstances than the usual, and I look forward to uh, seeing uh, colleagues face-to-face uh, in the future, but um, uh, I think we've probably learned a lot uh, during uh, the last year or more um, about how to um, reach um, uh, not only colleagues, but people with uh, interests in, in what we do. And uh, no doubt, uh, some of the things that we're doing, such as lectures, not only in person, but online, will be things that we pick up um, in the future. If you bear with me for just a second, I've got a PowerPoint to accompany this. Um, as a colleague uh, said to me, and, and now we're all used to using PowerPoints, uh, as a colleague once said, um, uh, if I don't use a PowerPoint these days, especially with students, uh, my students think that I'm some sort of slacker. Um, and uh, so I wouldn't want to create that uh, impression, uh, truthful though it may be. Um, uh, uh, first of all, I, I am a, myself a Canadian. Uh, I grew up in Toronto. Um, um, my uh, family background um, on my father's side is Scottish and indeed Gaelic speaking. And uh, But it was only uh, as an adult that I um, developed um, uh, an active interest in, in learning the language. And it has taken me on a, um, a rather interesting and unusual uh, path through life. Um, as Jimmy mentioned, I, I did my first degree at the University of Toronto, and as a teenager, I thought of going into the Canadian Foreign Service um, and um, uh, followed that with a degree in law uh, at Osgoode Hall um, in the 1980s. And it was a very exciting time to be a, a, a law student, uh, particularly uh, if one had an interest in uh, constitutional issues in human rights and in uh, indigenous or aboriginal issues uh, uh, thanks to the uh, patriation of the constitution in 1982 um, and, and that stayed with me i practiced law in toronto for a few years but, but managed to escape uh, by going to first the london school of economics to do uh, a master's in international law and then i got a job in scotland and I was able to develop my interest in Gaelic language and literature um, by doing a part-time PhD in Edinburgh on a Gaelic poet who had emigrated to Nova Scotia. But it was really um, in part uh, uh, because of um, Canada's uh, very considerable um, expertise in dealing with um, uh, linguistic diversity or aspects of linguistic diversity um, that I became interested in languages in general. And it was also a function of growing up in Toronto, a very multicultural city in which I heard all sorts of languages uh, being spoken on my own street growing up. And I think that uh, helped plant the seeds of an interest that's become an important part of my work. Um, as Jimmy says, I have uh, done a lot of work over the last 20 years or so with a variety of international institutions, 
And uh, not least, I've, I've done work on uh, Aboriginal uh, Indigenous issues uh, with the UN uh, in collaboration with my friend and colleague, Tovis Gutnap Kangas. Uh, I've uh, prepared um, two or three um, papers um, for the permanent forum on Indigenous peoples and also worked um, on um, uh, language issues in Nunavut. So I've tried to follow uh, what is happening back in Canada as closely as possible, um, not only in relation to official languages, but in relation to uh, community languages uh, and the languages of migrants and, and Indigenous languages as well. Um, today I'm going to talk about a relatively new piece of le Canadian federal legislation, um, which was passed uh, by the federal parliament um, in 2019, and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Um, uh, I will um, be focusing on that, but uh, I want to set to the context to a certain extent as well. Um, I'm very interested in uh, uh, Indigenous languages in Canada. Um, they, of course, uh, as, as I'll discuss uh, near the end of my presentation, um, the question of languages and their uh, vitality and their uh, revitalization cannot be uh, dissociated with a, a variety of other social issues. Um, um, and these other socio social issues in the context of Indigenous peoples include uh, obviously land rights, economic development, health and social uh, care issues, uh, all of which are, are part and parcel of um, uh, 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 of the context in, in which people live, uh, in which people um, uh, maintain and and perpetuate uh, their cultures, and um, one of the dangers is uh, treating language as an issue uh, that is only loosely related to these other issues. Um, so I, I apologize in advance in in that my focus will be primarily on language and on this piece of legislation, but it's important to recall and remember that um, uh, there are uh, an interlocking web of social issues which have an impact on, on language vitality. And that's something that has to be borne in mind uh, by governments um, when dealing with this issue. Um, uh, first, a word of background, and I'm sure that most in attendance uh, will be fairly aware of this. Um, uh, uh, Canada, of course, has a very developed regime for official languages, the two uh, official languages at the federal level of uh, French and English, uh, dating back to the Canada Act of 1867, in which um, French and English were uh, made official languages of the federal parliament and the federal courts. Um, in the 1960s, uh, as uh, most people in attendance will, will know, um, uh, there was a rising uh, a sense of nationalism in Quebec, and one of the responses of the federal government in the 1960s was to set up a royal commission on bilingualism and biculturalism, um, uh, which uh, uh, made a range of recommendations, but um, led um, uh, directly to the creation of uh, Canada's first official languages act, um, which extended the bilingual regime well beyond the federal parliament and the courts um, to um, uh, most aspects of um, the administration uh, 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 by the federal government of policies and, and, and practices. Um, in response to concerns of representatives from a variety of other ethnic backgrounds, um, a chapter was included in the Royal Commission report on multiculturalism. Um, and uh, this led um, to the development first of a policy in 1971 on multiculturalism and subsequently uh, a ministry um, um, and uh, legislation as well on multiculturalism, which doesn't have a strong linguistic aspect, but which has uh, as an infrastructure supported some expenditure on um, languages, language programming, uh, for uh, so-called heritage languages. But in the Royal Commission report, there was very little um, uh, attention given to Aboriginal Can Canadians and to Aboriginal languages. Um, uh, so they were uh, left out of the picture. 
Now, um, in 2016, um, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau made uh, the following statement, and it's on the screen. I hope it's not partly obliterated by um, uh, my, uh, a picture of myself talking. Uh, but he, he uh, said the following, we know all too well how residential schools and other decisions by governments were used as a deliberate tool to eliminate indigenous languages and cultures. If we are to truly advance reconciliation, we must undo the lasting damage that resulted. So today, I commit to you that our government will enact an Indigenous Languages Act co-developed with Indigenous peoples with the goal of ensuring the preservation, protection and revitalization of First Nations, Métis and Inuit languages in this country. A um, couple of things to note about this statement, uh, I think it was broadly welcomed, certainly by Indigenous peoples in Canada, um, guardedly so, um, but welcome nonetheless. Um, a few interesting things about the content of the statement. Um, for, note, for example, how the purpose of the legislation is framed. It's framed in terms of the preservation, the protection, and the revitalization of, of, of languages themselves um, uh, as part of a broader effort to truly advance reconciliation. Um, but there's no rec uh, reference to some of the principles and ideas that tend to underline uh, the recognition of minority language claims, um, including um, the recognition of minority language claims um, as part of our policies on official bilingualism. There's no references to equality, for example. This is fundamental uh, to the uh, official languages regime in Canada, that um, uh, uh, Francophone Canadians uh, and Anglophone Canadians should, in, in principle, uh, be entitled to the same uh, types of service and the same quality of service in the language of their choice um, from their federal government and its institutions. Um, so very much a, an equality aspect to um, uh, uh, official language policy in Canada and uh, more generally in international law. Um, also significantly, um, no use of the language of rights. Um, and in Canada, um, uh, language um, uh, issues, uh, particularly in relation to official languages, are generally framed in terms of rights. And in the growing international, um, uh, in a growing range of international principles on uh, languages, minority languages, indigenous languages, uh, the language of rights is quite common. Um, instead, we have an emphasis on what could be described as a social good, language preservation, um, but no clear links to the individual speaker. And that's something I'll come back to uh, a little later. Even the term reconciliation is consist uh, contested as it implies that there was once a harmonious relationship between settlers and indigenous peoples, which is being restored. Uh, something which many Indigenous uh, people do not accept. Um, with regard to legislating for language, um, the whole question here raises in a very, very clear way many of the issues uh, that are, are generally, uh, we generally confront um, when trying to uh, um, legislate and regulate um, in support of min minority languages and their speakers. Um, um, the most challenging questions in these areas uh, are, first of all, um, the notion that l legislation, that law, can be used as a sort of restitutionary instrument. Um, this is um, one of the uh, uh, more interesting and unique aspects of language law more generally and language rights. Um, uh, particularly in the context of uh, uh, maintaining and re revitalizing language, um, we, we get the sense that uh, government action is directed at restitution, um, putting something right. This is tied to another fundamental aspect of, of this legislation and many other efforts um, that are made to support minority languages. The idea that legislation um, can um, promote um, a societal change, um, what we might describe as social engineering, um, uh, 
uh, that um, as a result of legislative action and government intervention, um, that uh, social processes in relation to language can be changed. Um, and uh, this presents challenges from the perspective of uh, sociolinguists um, who, um, following on from one of the fathers of uh, theorizing about uh, minority language maintenance and preservation, uh, Joshua Fishman, uh, he pointed out that um, uh, revitalizing languages is particularly challenging and it's particularly challenging for government because in the first instance uh, what is most essential is the transmission um, in the family context in the home between generations of the language um, and behavior of individuals um, or, or, or families is difficult to regulate and in general uh, we think that this is uh, an area that government should perhaps not be uh, attempting to influence the behavior in, in families. So it presents um, that sort of challenge as well. Uh, um, and finally, as I'll discuss in more detail, um, we have one piece of legislation uh, that is meant to deal with an extremely complex linguistic context as well, as we'll see in a couple of moments. Uh, we have a large number of Indigenous languages in Canada. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, their demographics and in terms of other measures of their vitality, uh, they're in very, very different uh, uh, circumstances. And um, uh, this always poses problems uh, when trying to uh, legislate. A bit of background. Um, the Assembly for First Nations has been um, uh, focusing on language issues for quite a long time, certainly uh, as early as the early 1970s, um, uh, the Assembly was uh, looking at um, uh, language as an important uh, issue um, and language loss as being a particularly important issue. Um, but um, uh, as with um, many other aspects of, um, uh, of Indigenous policy, Aboriginal policy in Canada, um, the Oka crisis uh, played a very significant uh, part. Um, uh, those of, many of you will recall the crisis in uh, eight, 1989, a golf club in Oka, Quebec, uh, sought to expand a golf course on land that had been claimed by the local Mohawk community. And when approved in 1990 by the local council, uh, the Mohawk erected a barricade to block access to the disputed area. The mayor called in the uh, Quebec police, and on the 11th of July 1990, a gun battle ensued, resulting in the death um, of a police officer. Um, in August, uh, Quebec Premier, uh, the Quebec Premier uh, called in the Canadian Army, and the RCMP replaced uh, the Quebec police. Uh, the crisis finally ended on the 26th of September 1990, when the federal government agreed to uh, purchase the land uh, that was being disputed from the developers for $5.3 million. Um, but the crisis brought huge international attention and national attention. Images such as the one you see uh, uh, standoff between the Canadian Armed Forces and uh, uh, Mohawk um, trying to defend uh, their, um, their, their, their historical territories. Uh, brought unprecedented uh, attention to Aboriginal issues um, and opened the door to um, um, a, a lot of soul searching uh, about a range of these issues that went well beyond the immediate uh, dispute that had given rise to the crisis. Um, one of the government's responses uh, was the creation of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Um, the federal government established it in 1991 as a response to the Oka crisis. Uh, its co-chairs were René Dussault and uh, George Erasmus, um, uh, with a number of uh, other commissioners, uh, including uh, Bertha Wilson. Um, the um, Royal Commission produced a huge amount of research, very valuable research as well, um, and included uh, uh, a considerable amount of research uh, 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 on the operation and effects of the residential school system. And out of the report, um, 
uh, among the 440 recommendations were uh, the one you see on the screen. We proposed the establishment of an Aboriginal Languages Foundation to document, study, and conserve Aboriginal languages and to help Aboriginal people arrest and reverse the loss of languages uh, that has already occurred. Um, uh, but, but of course, um, uh, the uh, research um, documented uh, huge and widespread abuse in the residential school system. Um, the residential schools, as most of you may know, uh, were first created in 1879 and operated in, uh, as late as 1996. And it's estimated about 30% of Indigenous children had been educated in them over the years, perhaps 150,000 in total. Um, the um, uh, system removed children from their families, deprived them of their ancestral languages, and exposed many to physical and sexual abuse. Uh, large numbers of lawsuits were brought by survivors of the schools against the Canadian federal government and churches, and an office of Indian Residential Schools Resolution Canada was established by the federal government in 2001 uh, to manage and resolve the large number of claims that arose. On the 23rd of November, 2005, um, uh, the uh, Paul Martin government announced uh, the in, in, in Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement between the federal government and about 86,000 survivors of the system, uh, uh, establishing a $1.9 billion compensation fund, which came to a, into effect in September of 2007. Um, also, uh, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada was established. Uh, it was a component of the agreement, um, uh, uh, and it was established on the 2nd of July 2008 to document and preserve the experiences of survivors. On the 11th of June 2008, uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Stephen Harper um, uh, uh, made a speech in Parliament um, uh, on the Commission. Um, and the Commission took 7,000 survivor statements or thereabouts, and these and thousands of uh, documents and photographs are now held by the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation at the University of Manitoba. Uh, the Commission was chaired by Justice Murray Sinclair, um, an Ojibwe judge, uh, and the Commission released an executive summary of its findings with 94 calls to action in June of 2015, it was these that prompted um, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's announcement. The uh, Liberal government famously committed itself uh, to uh, acting on all 94 of these. Um, a multi-volume report was also um, uh, 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 produced, um, and one of its conclusions was that the residential schools uh, system amounted to cultural genocide. With regards to demographics, um, very important to consider um, the demographics of uh, Indigenous languages because it helps us to understand some of the challenges uh, that are faced um, in uh, legislating. Um, more than 70 Indigenous languages were reported in the 2016 Canadian Census. In, 12 different families, uh, Algonquian languages, such as Cree, Ojibwa, Oji Cree, Innu, and Mi'kmaq, um, Inuit languages, Athabascan languages, particularly Dene, uh, Siouan languages, Salish languages, uh, Tsimshian languages, Wakashian languages, Iroquoian languages, which include Mohawk, uh, Michif, the language of the Métis, a language formed by um, the meeting of French and um, uh, 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 indigenous languages, particularly Cree and Ojibwa, Tlingit, uh, Kootenai, and Haida. Um, in 2016, uh, some 260,550 uh, 260, people reported being able to speak uh, an indigenous language well enough to hold a conversation. About 15% of the indigenous population of 1.7 million. Um, and that's a decrease in the percentages from 2006, uh, though the total numbers of speakers uh, between 2006 and 2021 had gone up. Um, so the decreasing percentage is a function of the very, very high 
birth rate in, in indigenous communities in Scotland. Um, the numbers of speakers exceeded the numbers reported to have an indigenous language as a mother tongue, um, only uh, 208,000 or 12.5% um, uh, of the population claimed to have an indigenous language as a mother tongue. Um, very interesting census uh, data such as this, the census provides a very broad information on language and other issues. Um, a, a lot more work has to be done to understand uh, precisely what is going on and uh, what explains this difference, but it does suggest that significant numbers of Indigenous peoples in Canada are acquiring their languages um, uh, outside of the home. Um, just a quick look at the uh, map as a distribution, and by the way, I'm very happy to um, share these slides. Um, if anyone uh, wishes them, uh, by all means write me. Um, I think my email address can be circulated, and if I remember before the end of my presentation, I'll, um, I'll send out a little um, uh, message um, in the chat function with, with my email. Um, but this gives a, an idea of the distribution of the languages. Um, we see um, uh, the Inuit languages in uh, the far north, um, and then this long uh, area covered by Algonquian languages stretching from uh, Nova Scotia, where Mi'kmaq is still spoken in the east, to uh, uh, Plains Cree, a related language from the same family in the west. Also notable is, uh, we'll take a look at the actual numbers of speakers in a moment, um, but uh, Cree, Ojibwa, and uh, uh, Inuktut uh, are the most widely spoken uh, languages and considered by linguists to be um, in the strongest position. Um, on the west coast of Canada, in British Columbia and in Yukon, we have the highest number of uh, languages and the largest number of distinct language families as well. Um, and these are also um, some of the most threatened uh, of the um, uh, Aboriginal languages of Canada. Um, and they present particular challenges. They were relatively late in coming into contact with European languages. Um, but have suffered um, uh, even more um, uh, considerably um, than um, uh, 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 Aboriginal languages in other parts of the country. Um, again, here, here are again some data from, from the census. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, at least two of the uh, Algonquian languages, Cree, which has many di different dialects, uh, as well as Ojibwa and Oji Cree, um, all close, fairly closely related languages, are, are uh, spoken by large numbers, about 100,000 uh, Cree speakers. Um, and it is without question the strongest of uh, the Aboriginal languages. Inuit languages, uh, primarily Inuktut, are spoken by over 40,000. Uh, almost 40,000 of those are uh, speakers of Inuktut or Inuktitut. Um, Dene is also a fairly widely spoken language, um, but Inuit um, as well as Cree and Ojibwa are the three uh, most widely spoken languages. Uh, whereas when we take a look at some of the West Coast languages, uh, Gitchan, uh, Michif, uh, the language spoken by Métis, as well as Haida, Tlingit, Kootenai, is spoken by very small numbers of people and increasingly elderly people as well. Um, and they are uh, very vulnerable languages, um, uh, really in danger of extinction. Um, all of the languages, except for the three largest ones, are considered to be highly threatened languages. And therefore, the question of language maintenance, uh, to say nothing of revitalization, uh, is one that poses very, very major challenges uh, for policymakers who are interested. Um, just a few other uh, relevant facts. 64% um, of Inuit are uh, claimed to be able to hold a conversation in an Inuit language. Um, however, there are very significant differences by region. Um, uh, the territory of Nunavik, um, which is the traditional territory of the Inuit in Quebec, um, virtually everybody speaks um, in Inuktut. Um, in Nunavut itself, about 90% of the uh, population speak the language. Whereas uh, in uh, the Northwest Territories, 
Newfoundland and Labrador, um, the percentages are very, very, uh, very much lower. Another very important fact is that, um, like the Aboriginal population as a whole, uh, some original Aboriginal Indigenous peoples live on reserve lands, uh, but very many live uh, off reserve and particularly in urban areas um, and programming uh, for Aboriginal peoples who live in urban areas presents uh, uh, again um, a complicating factor uh, for uh, language planners um, uh, and those interested in language maintenance. 44% um, uh, of First Nations people uh, 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 live uh, on reserves, um, but 72% of those uh, speaking an Aboriginal language live on reserves. So um, the reserve uh, system uh, is very important um, uh, uh, in terms of language maintenance. Um, uh, the much lower percentages living off reserve who have maintained their language shows the very significant challenge in language preservation um, where Indigenous peoples don't live in a supportive community. Um, and again, on reserves, all, close to 50% uh, speak uh, an Aboriginal language as compared to a much smaller percentage off, off, um, uh, language, uh, off, off reserves. Um, but the matter that concerns linguists and sociolinguists the most is that there's much higher percentages of older people who speak uh, Indigenous languages than younger people, suggesting that the languages are not being passed along as strongly as would be desirable um, for their maintenance. Just a couple of words about Canada's international legal obligations. Um, there are um, a, a range of international instruments of relevance. Uh, time doesn't permit me to go through them in uh, any detail at all. Um, but there are um, uh, some international instruments that are, uh, many of these instruments are human rights in instruments or minority rights instruments and generally indigenous peoples not only in canada but elsewhere are considered to be uh, minorities in international law but not all minorities are considered to be indigenous peoples um, and in relation to uh, so, so indigenous peoples benefit from measures in international law in, in relation to minorities but there are also international obligations that are specifically directed at Indigenous peoples. Um, the most important binding obligations, the binding in international law, are set in, out in the International Labour Organization's Convention Number 169 concerning Indigenous and tribal peoples in independent countries of 1989. Um, the International Labour Organization, of course, is a uh, member organization of the United Nations, um, and it has played an important role in developing standards. Canada, um, as well as um, uh, other uh, settler uh, countries um, in the Anglosphere, um, uh, the United States, uh, Australia, and New Zealand, has not signed or ratified ILO Convention 169, nor did it sign an earlier, um, less um, helpful, um, convention, ILO Convention Number 107. So the most important binding international obligations are in a treaty that Canada has not yet ratified. Um, the UN, uh, for a number of years, um, worked on a, a General Assembly Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. UN General Assembly Declarations don't have the force of binding international law. They are politically very significant. Um, and so the UN General Assembly uh, Declaration, when it was finally put before and um, um, uh, accepted by the UN General Assembly in 2007, was a very important development. But Canada was one of four states, again, Australia, US, and New Zealand, uh, which uh, actually voted against uh, the um, uh, acceptance of the uh, General Assembly Declaration in 2007. There were 143 states which voted in favor and 11 which abstained. In May of 2016, however, Canada reversed its position and has now accepted 
the General uh, Assembly Declaration. And the General Assembly Declaration is referred to in the legislation that I'll be talking about in a couple of moments um, as part of the context, and it contains um, some imp imp important principles. Um, uh, notably, Article 13, which um, says that Indigenous peoples have the right to revitalize, use, develop, and transmit to future generations their histories, languages, oral traditions, philosophies, writing systems, and literatures, and to designate and retain their own names for communities, places, and persons. So that's of obvious relevance to language. Article 13.2 uh, also requires that states ensure that Indigenous peoples um, can understand and be understood in political, legal, and administrative proceedings where necessary through the provision of interpretation or by other appropriate means. Article 14 is also very important uh, in relation to language. It provides that Indigenous peoples have the right to establish and control their educational systems and institutions, providing education in their own languages in a manner appropriate to their cultural methods of teaching and learning. And uh, another subsection in Article 14 says that states shall, shall, they must, in conjunction with Indigenous peoples, take effective measures in order for the Indigenous individuals, particularly children, including those living outside their communities, in other words, the non-reservation um, uh, Aboriginal peoples of Canada, uh, to have access where possible to an education in their own culture and provided in their own language. Very important principle, because um, if Canada were to implement it, either in legislation or otherwise, it would require the development of educational programming uh, for off-reserve Indigenous peoples, those living in urban areas, like our major cities. And there are, as, um, as I'm sure people know, very large Indigenous populations in Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, Winnipeg, um, um, Calgary, uh, Vancouver, virtually all of our, our major cities, uh, Halifax, and so forth. Now, there are another number of international treaties that do create binding obligations and which are of relevance, especially regarding education, such as the uh, UN Convention Covenant on Civil and Political Rights of 1966, uh, the 1966 Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and very importantly, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. But I won't talk more about these uh, obligations right, right, right now. Um, I'm happy to take questions on them or follow up for those that are interested. Now, with regard to the context, um, as once again, uh, this is uh, very basic for, for most of you, no doubt, but uh, Canada's constitution creates a federal state with 10 provinces and three territories. Um, um, and um, Indigenous peoples are within the exclusive jurisdiction of the federal parliament. Um, Canada's federal level is, is, as I noted, officially bilingual uh, by virtue of the Constitution Act of 1867, the Constitution Act of 1982, uh, in particular the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, sections 16 to 20, um, as well as uh, section uh, 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 23, which creates um, minority language education rights. Um, and of course, the Official Languages Act of 1969 and of 1988. And uh, you may know that the uh, federal government has begun the process of um, uh, revising and bringing up to date uh, the Official Languages Act. And there were some references in the context of uh, the launch of consultations on a, a new revised Official Languages Act of, of uh, Aboriginal and Indigenous languages. Um, but there's no explicit recognition in the Constitution or other federal legislation of Indigenous languages. However, we do have this very important provision in the Canadian Constitution of 1982, Section 35, and you have it on the screen in front of you, which says the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights um, of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. And the Aboriginal peoples are defined in Section 35 as including the Inuit, uh, Indian, Inuit and Métis peoples. Um, when it was included in the Constitution, it was very general and broad, but the Supreme Court of Canada 
has given it huge amount of additional content through a large number of very important decisions on a, a large range of issues, including land, land rights. And uh, I, I'm not able to go into that jurisprudence today. It's huge and it would take uh, many lectures um, to, to uh, explicate it. However, uh, out of uh, relatively um, uh, general provisions such as Section 35, uh, a number of important principles in a wide variety of, of policy areas have risen. Nothing yet explicitly on language, um, but some principles um, have emerged in cases um, which have obvious relevance uh, for language. Um, for example, the R. and Van Peet case of 1996, the Supreme Court have established a test uh, for whether an Aboriginal right under Section 35 exists. Um, and uh, the court said that Aboriginal rights are, quotes, the practices, traditions, and customs central to Aboriginal societies that existed in North America prior to contact with Europeans. And it's been argued by legal scholars uh, that languages were clearly central to Aboriginal societies prior to contact. And they have been transmitted intergenerationally right up to the present. So therefore, Section 35 must include language um, as um, uh, language rights as part of Aboriginal rights. In a subsequent case from 2003, uh, R. and Pauli, uh, Supreme Court, in relation to Métis Aboriginal rights under Section 35, said the purpose and the promise of Section 35 is to protect practices that were historically important features of these distinctive communities and that persist in the present day as integral elements of their Métis culture. And for Métis, you can also read uh, Indian and Inuit cultures. Once again, um, the argument is um, that this clearly must embrace uh, language and rights to language as well. Um, with regard to the legal status um, um, at the provincial and territorial level, there's generally no status for um, Aboriginal languages within provinces. Um, but the Northwest Territories in 1988 enacted an Official Languages Act, which recognized English and French and nine Indigenous languages, which I've listed there, as official language, um, though um, English and French have a very privileged status, um, the guarantees and protections and the rights uh, for speakers of the nine other languages are hemmed in in a variety of ways. And again, might be interesting to look at this as well as Nunavut at some other point, um, perhaps a future conference when I'll submit a, a paper myself. Um, but um, um, uh, 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 at this point, um, I don't have time to explain how, how that system works in any detail. Nunavut, of course, was created in 1999 as a result of a major land claims agreement uh, concluded uh, in 1993. Um, and um, uh, part and parcel of the land claims agreement and the establishment of Nunavut was the protection of Inuit uh, language and culture. Um, and in 2008, uh, Nunavut, um, uh, Nunavut's legis legislature passed a, an official languages act, uh, which made English, French, and Inuit languages, both Inuktitut and Inuit um official languages uh, of, of uh, Nunavut. Um, the uh, legislature also passed um, an Inuit language protection act of that year. Uh, which is a very interesting act in that, um, in some respects, um, it is one of the strongest pieces of language legislation in the world. Um, it um, certainly uh, it was inspired to a certain extent by the uh, Charter of the French Language, uh, popularly known as Bill 101 in Quebec, uh, which imposed obligations not only on the state, uh, but on uh, private actors, the private sector, the voluntary sector. And similarly, the Inuit Language Protection Act um, imposes, in principle, uh, obligations with regard to providing services, um, uh, not only by the government, uh, something covered by the uh, Official Languages Act of Nunavut, but by um, private and voluntary sector organizations as well. 
but also a, an education act was passed in 2008 um, um, uh, to uh, essentially begin the process of ensuring that instruction through the medium of Inuit, Inuit languages takes place. However, um, this act in particular has given rise to considerable controversy, and I don't have time to go into it now, but um, um, uh, a, 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 the, the, a, the rate at which the uh, Education Act provisions were being implemented was very slow, and it was clear that the um, timeframes that had been anticipated for the rollout of teaching through the medium of Inuit languages were not going to be met. And therefore, the Nunavut um, uh, Assembly passed an Interim Language of Instruction Act um, in 2009 um, to amend the, uh, the Education Act and the uh, Language Protection Act uh, to significantly impl uh, delay implementation of key uh, obligations. Um, and this has given rise to considerable um, controversy um, in uh, Nunavut. Um, again, a very interesting and challenging set of issues, uh, but I don't have the time, unfortunately, today. So I'd like to now, uh, in the last part of my presentation, focus on uh, the new federal legislation, um, the Inuit, uh, uh, the, the Aboriginal Languages Act of 2019. And as I mentioned, there's a very strong uh, link to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Um, its uh, recommendations um, uh, included uh, that reconciliation requires the preservation and revitalization of Aboriginal languages. And the 94 calls to action included um, those set out on the uh, screen that the federal government has a responsibility to provide sufficient funds for Aboriginal language preservation and revitalization. That the federal government uh, must acknowledge that Aboriginal rights include Abor Aboriginal language rights, um, Aboriginal rights that is defined under Section 35 of the Constitution. Um, also, a call to, one of the calls to action was that the federal government had to uh, enact an Aboriginal Languages Act. And in relation to Aboriginal education, one of the calls to action specified that the federal government uh, should draft new Aboriginal language ed uh, education legislation um, with um, full participation and informed consent of Aboriginal peoples, incorporating a number of principles, including protecting the right to Aboriginal languages, including the teaching of Aboriginal languages as credit courses. And we await uh, this piece of legislation. Um, just an aside on the use of Indigenous languages in the Canadian Parliament. Um, uh, many of you may have uh, seen um, uh, uh, what's now become a fairly well-known use of uh, the Mohawk language in Parliament um, by Mark Miller. Um, who is a Liberal MP from Montreal, and I was going to play uh, a, a clip from the Parliament, um, but uh, in the interest of time, I think I will press on. Uh, but you'll see him, uh, uh, again, I'm very happy to um, uh, distribute the slides, and you can then click on the hyperlink. Um, but he made a, a short, but um, uh, clearly an impressive uh, speech in, in um, oops, I've, I've uh, done what I didn't want to do, excuse me, let me just get uh, back to where I was. Um, he had been learning um, Mohawk for some time, um, and um, uh, he describes that process in a, um, a press conference, that's the second clip here, which you can take a look at at your leisure, um, in November of 2019, when he was made Indigenous Services Minister, and he spoke about his process. Um, of learning Mohawk. It started because he's fluently, although an Anglophone, fluently bilingual uh, one. He's a corporate lawyer from Montreal by training, and he wanted to encourage uh, more of his colleagues in the, the federal parliament, particularly Anglophone colleagues, to really take up the challenge of learning and becoming fluent in French. And he thought the best way to do this would be to try and learn a, an Aboriginal language. And the one he chose was the language of the Aboriginal peoples uh, of 
um, uh, Montreal and surrounding areas, the Mohawk. Um, and he's made quite considerable progress. And it's quite clear, um, both based on um, his quite clear fluency, I, I don't speak Mohawk myself, um, but from the reaction and from the comments made by his teacher, that he has taken this seriously. And I, I don't think anybody can question his own personal commitment here. Um, other MPs have occasionally used an Aboriginal language. Um, uh, the Liberal from Winnipeg Centre, Robert Falcon Ulet, has used Cree and has fought for the right to do so. And because of this, in 2018, um, a standing committee on the procedure of House Affairs uh, produced a report on the issue of the use of Indigenous languages in proceedings of the House of Commons. Um, and uh, they concluded that um, they were convinced that the inability of members to speak in, in an Indigenous language in the House and to be as understood is not consistent with Cana current Canadian values, nor with the spirit of ongoing reconciliation between Canada's Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. And uh, the recommendations um, uh, uh, included um, uh, recognition of the use of Indigenous languages in the House. Um, so, um, in many respects, uh, a, a, more, a more a symbolic move than anything else, but a, a real one, and perhaps indicative of a, a changing perspective on uh, Aboriginal languages. Finally, I'm going to finish my presentation by talking about the Indigenous Languages Act of 2019. It was introduced into the House of Commons, given first reading on the 5th of February 2019. It was passed uh, by the Parliament and given royal assent on the 21st of June. So it progressed through Parliament very quickly and um, there were very few changes made. Many pieces of legislation, of course, undergo very significant uh, amendments. Um, uh, there were some interesting and in one or two cases important amendments, uh, but generally speaking, the legislation uh, did not change much um, uh, as compared to um, how, how it appeared when it was introduced in February. There's a very extensive preamble um, and it, the preamble contains uh, some very important principles and I didn't list them, but I'd like to describe them. Now, the preamble of a piece of legislation does not contain any obligations, uh, but preambles are very important in interpreting um, the provisions of an act. Um, first, the preamble states that at the outset that the recognition and implementation of rights related to Indigenous languages are at the core of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples um, and are fundamental to shaping the country. And it made reference to the Truth and Reconciliation Recon Commission's calls to action. Second, it reiterated the government's commitment to implementing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, which affirms the rights related to Indigenous languages. So here we have the language of rights creeping into the preamble, but as we'll see, not into the legislation itself. The preamble also recognizes that Indigenous languages were the first languages spoken in the lands that are now Canada, that such languages played a significant part in the establishment of relations between Europeans and Indigenous peoples, and that Indigenous peoples have played a significant role in the development of Canada, and Indigenous languages contribute to the diversity and richness of the linguistic and cultural heritage of Canada. The preamble also recognizes that a history of discriminatory government policies and practices in respect of, among other things, assimilation, forced relocation, and residential schools were detrimental to Indigenous languages and contributed significantly to the erosion of those languages. Very important that the government is accepting agency in the decline of uh, Aboriginal languages. And while the status and vitality of those languages varies, there is an urgent need to support the efforts of Indigenous peoples to reclaim, revitalize, maintain, and strengthen them. The preamble recognizes that Indigenous languages are fundamental to the identities, culture, cultures, spirituality, relationships to the land, worldviews, and self-determination of Indigenous peoples, and that efforts to protect the vitality of Indigenous languages contribute to the enrichment of Indigenous knowledge, as well as to the prevention of the loss of cultural diversity 
biodiversity and spirituality. And here, interesting links um, to um, uh, thinking and uh, th that's going on at the international language uh, le level and in international instruments on cultural diversity and on uh, minority languages. Um, these linkages with uh, between language diversity and biodiversity are increasingly made. Um, very important developments um, that are relatively new in law, not only um, internationally, but in, in other jurisdictions as well. However, things also get a little ambiguous in places in the uh, preamble. The preamble notes that there is a variety of entities in different regions which have mandates to promote the use of Indigenous languages, and that there is a need for the Government of Canada to provide continuing support to those entities. It notes that the Government of Canada is committed to providing adequate, sustainable and long-term funding for the reclamation, revitalization, maintenance and strengthening of Indigenous languages. But um, um, uh, what constitutes adequate is uh, like beauty often in the eye of the beholder. And finally, it notes um, an issue that I described at the beginning of my presentation, namely, uh, it says that a flexible approach that takes into account the unique circumstances and needs of Indigenous groups, communities and peoples is required in light of the diversity of identities, cultures and histories of Indigenous peoples. Uh, an obvious recognition of the complexity here, uh, that trying to create um, some sort of statutory and policy basis to support a widely spoken language such as Cree um, uh, it might be very different from what is needed for a language like Haida or Kootenai, which is spoken by a very small number of increasingly elderly people. Um, but that presents difficulties because in the uh, a, a desire to be inclusive um, uh, of uh, this huge variety, um, uh, an implication is often uh, that specificity is lost. Now, with regard to the provisions themselves, um, Section 3 uh, provides that the Act is to be construed as upholding the rights of Indigenous peoples recognized and affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitutional Act, Constitution Act, the section that I referred to before, and not as abrogating uh, or, de or derogating from them. However, there's an element of circularity to this because um, uh, article, uh, thir uh, Section 35 does not itself specify which rights these are and how they relate to language. This is one of the big issues. What, what are Section 35 Aboriginal rights uh, in relation to languages? Section 5 sets out the purposes of the Act, um, but it doesn't create any substantive rights or any clear substantive obligations. So the uh, purposes are generally laudable, um, but again, there's this lack of detail. Section 6 refers to the rights related to Indigenous language, but merely says that the Government of Canada recognizes that the rights of Indigenous people recognized and infer, affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitution Act includes rights related to Indigenous languages. Um, again, it doesn't specify what those precise rights are, but this is an important um, recognition um, that although undetermined, um, language rights are included in Section 35. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, legal scholars have argued that that, that is the case, uh, but here in a piece of federal legislation, the government is recognizing it. Section 7 requires the Minister of Canadian Heritage to consult with a variety of Indigenous groups and other Indigenous governing bodies in order to meet the objectives of providing uh, adequate, sustainable and long-term funding. So an obligation to meet and discuss uh, but no guarantees as to what the outcomes will be or should be. Um, then a couple of interesting, potentially important provisions relating to federal institutions. Um, Section 10.1, which was added um, in the legislative process. It was not in the original bill as tabled in February of 2019. And it is essentially an enabling provision. It says that federal institutions may in accordance with the regulation with regulations provide access to services in an indigenous language if the institution has the capacity to do so and if there is sufficient demand for access to those services um, 
So it recognizes not a right to receive services from federal institutions. It leaves things with the federal government. It says that the federal institutions may themselves, but do not must provide such services. Uh, but it conditions it, um, first of all, um, by saying that it may only do so if the institution has the capacity to do so. And of course, one of the big problems in language legislation generally is that governments often claim that they would like to do more, but they don't have the capacity. It's a bit of a chicken and egg issue. Uh, they don't have the capacity because they haven't developed the capacity. Um, uh, so um, uh, a, a problematic and interesting and potentially useful uh, provision, but highly problematic. And then it um, talks about demand for access to services. And in terms of language rights and language legislation, or generally, this is also problematic. Um, minorities um, who are accustomed to dealing with officialdom in official languages um, generally need to be prompted and supported in gaining access to services in their own language. And uh, demanding those services uh, is generally not something they do. And because uh, the overwhelming majority of Indigenous peoples, like other linguistic minorities, are bilingual in their native language and either English or French, um, uh, they might not, there, there isn't the same necessity that might exist uh, otherwise. Section 11 is another enabling provision. It says that a federal institution, again, may, but not must, cause documents under its control be translated into an Indigenous language or, or may cause interpretation services to be provided. Useful, but it's not mandatory. It's left to the government itself. Final portion of the proposed, uh, I should say, uh, should change that. It should have read of the Act. It's no longer a proposed Act. Relates to a new officer of Commissioner of Indigenous Languages. Um, there are a large number of provisions. Um, the uh, most important though are section 23, which sets out a detailed mandate of the office of the com commissioner. And it has different sorts of functions, but an important area is promotional, um, including promotion of indigenous languages, Aboriginal languages amongst Aboriginal peoples, but also a, a, a wider public awareness about indigenous languages in Canada, a very potentially very useful um, a provision and a very useful function. Um, generally speaking, um, non-Aboriginal Canadians have very little knowledge uh, about Aboriginal Indigenous languages and their associated literatures, oral and otherwise cultures and so forth. So promoting a greater awareness is often the first step towards promoting a greater appreciation of the value and richness of this tradition. And with that, greater support for more investment and support. So potentially very important and useful function for the commissioner. Um, the commissioner also has a, a, a mandate to support language revitalization um, and a role in facilitating the resolution of disputes and investigation of complaints. Um, uh, also, the uh, a, a wide range of research activities uh, are, are permitted and required of the commissioner. Section 26 sets out a range of dispute resolution services that the, off, uh, the office may offer in relation to undetermined agreements, which may ultimately be arrived at between uh, governments and Aboriginal uh, self-governments and Aboriginal groups. And section 27 offers a mechanism for making complaints, including by individuals. Um, and where a complaint is made, the office has the power of investigating it um, and uh, must make a report which may contain recommendations for change. However, this is another very problematic aspect, uh, uh, a very weak provision compared to the powers, for example, of the Commissioner of Official Languages, uh, oversees the official languages of Canada, who has enforcement powers as well. Um, what happens once recommendations are made is not specified, um, and there is no suggestion that the uh, recommendations, if made to a federal institution, for example, or other government, uh, need be followed, and there's no mechanism for implementing them. So 
um, a useful function, but hamstrung in many ways. So just some concluding thoughts. Um, one of the most controversial aspects is that there was nothing on education. This was a disappointment because of the very clear principles in the UN General Assembly Declaration, particularly Article 14 that I discussed above, uh, before. But there's no, for example, reference to education, no, certainly no right to have children educated in their languages, especially through immersion education. And this was viewed by many, including myself, as a significant weakness. No explicit rights enumerated, um, and therefore we're no closer to understanding what Indigenous peoples may expect from the federal government, um, which serves them. Uh, there's uh, lots of references to the importance of funding, but no firm commitments with regard uh, to funding and uh, a duty on the federal government to consult, um, but not necessarily to adhere to the wishes of Indigenous peoples. Um, and so some critics have described this legislation as merely an aspirational policy statement. And I think there is some force to that. Um, finally, just a bit of news, um, uh, the commissioner has not yet been um, uh, 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 appointed, nor has the uh, advisory committee uh, that's to be created under the legislation. Um, I understand, I've been following this issue about every, once a week I check to see whether there's been any development. In December of 2020, the Minister of Canadian Heritage, Stephen Guibault, uh, uh, initiates the recruitment of the new commissioners and three directors of the office um, and announced that the office would receive 334 million in Canadian funding over five years. And this is a significant amount without question, um, but without knowing what sort of initiatives are essential um, it's difficult to say um, uh, in the abstract um, whether this uh, 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 funding is sufficient to the task. So I just conclude by saying um, that um, this legislation is undoubtedly historic and important. Um, it uh, goes beyond the merely symbolic, but it leaves a number of questions unresolved, partly because those questions are very difficult to answer. Um, given the complexity of the linguistic situation um, faced by Indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, but uh, it at least creates a variety of new mechanisms um, which need to be given time uh, to get up and running and see how they perform. Um, this will almost certainly not be the last that we hear of it. Um, um, for many, a disappointing first step but nonetheless, um, an important first step in many respects. And I'd like to conclude with that. Uh, notice the time. I've, Jimmy knows me well, and uh, uh, too often I uh, go on a little too long, which I've done again tonight, for which I apologize. Um, but thank you, one and all, for, um, for listening to me. Um, I'm happy to take questions, happy to send along my PowerPoint, happy to engage um, um, in a variety of ways, including email. And uh, once again, my sincere and heartfelt thanks to the organizers for doing me the honor of giving this presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, and uh, in, in, in my opinion, anyhow, uh, you certainly didn't go on for too long. Uh, all of the content was very fascinating. Thank you for sharing your lecture with us. Um, I'm going to open the floor up to questions from our audience. Uh, for those of you who may have only joined recently, I'm just going to point out that there is a, an option at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, if you want to raise your virtual hand, just hover your cursor to the bottom of your screen. There's a button called Reactions. And if you press on that, um, you can see the raise hand option. And this way, we can see that and uh, get to you uh, for your questions. I'll take the, uh, I'll take the first question. Sorry, that's, that's poor form, but um, anyhow, I, I'm really interested in um, language acquisition, mostly from a personal perspective. I'm someone 
who is a product of the Anglo-Canadian school system outside of Quebec, took French for 11 years in public school and didn't leave being able to have even a basic conversation in it until I moved to Quebec as a 24 year old. Um, and it took a few years, but eventually become, you know, functionally bilingual anyways. And I'm learning additional languages since. I wonder about, um, of course, in Canada, the context is so interesting with there being so many, um, so many uh, indigenous languages, but I'm thinking of the practicalities of acquiring a second, third language. Are there any examples that have been set elsewhere in the world, um, you know, with, with either indigenous or minority languages about how we can actually get to this point where we can start using these minority languages in a more official capacity? Th thanks for your question, and it's a very good one, a very complex one, and um, uh, I'll try to uh, just stick to a few main points. Um, my experience is very similar to yours. I um, was just of the age where French immersion was uh, beginning to be in junior high, and I'd already started taking French as a language. Um, my parents were very keen that uh, that I became bilingual, but uh, you know it was an experiment in Toronto in those days. So I just carried on with French as a subject. Um, um, I did manage to get a reasonable level of fluency, um, and once I finished doing French at the end of secondary school, that fluency dropped off. Um, I'm at the point where I'm trying to resuscitate my French um, because I have a son who's in Gallic medium education here in Edinburgh, and uh, they're doing an additional language, which is French. So I've been trying to help him with his French. And for the last year and a half, I've been going to the Institut Francais des Crosses um, to improve my uh, French. And um, I think I'm making some progress, but it's frustrating. My first second language is not as strong as it once was, and I'd like it to be. But the question is a very good one. Um, and with regard to pedagogies, now, now we have a lot of experience in international, uh, internationally, and there's huge literature. And of course, immersion education is um, uh, something that was pioneered in, in Canada in many ways in the 1960s in Quebec. And um, many jurisdictions have looked to Canada for that experience here in, in the United Kingdom and Ireland. Um, the, the Welsh language immersion models and the Irish language immersion models um, have very much been informed by the Canadian experience. Um, but even with full immersion to the end of secondary school, um, you know, the, the, the ability to communicate differs very greatly. Um, the uh, former commissioner of official languages, uh, Gra Graham uh, Fraser, did a fantastic book that people may be familiar uh, with. Uh, uh, um, I think shortly be before he became uh, commissioner of official languages. I believe, I can't remember who published it, but um, uh, entitled, Sorry, I Don't Speak French. And it's as good a, um, uh, a popular, but also, you know, very solidly researched book on the many challenges, but this is one of the things he points out. Uh, and of course, people's fluency in the language drops off even after full immersion, if they're not using it. So the question of not only equipping people with the language, but then creating the opportunities to use the language is very important. And this is where the provision of government services is thought to play an important part. And this is why this is often a part of any strategy and, and also the relevant international instruments. Um, there's a considerable amount of experience, but I, I think the, the most contested and difficult area is um, this fundamental aspect that we both hinted at of creating spaces and opportunities for speaking the language. As um, one of my friends and colleagues in Wales, where there have been huge strides made in institutionalizing the Welsh language, um, has pointed out, um, you know, the concentration is typically in language legislation on services from the government. But um, most of our lives, uh, they're not, we, we, most of our daily encounters are not with the government. Um, we tend to deal with the government fairly infrequently, mostly in relation to education if you have kids or COVID vaccines or, or, or that sort of thing. We're filling in tax forms, but most of our daily communications are with shopkeepers or with um, neighbors and so forth. And um, creating um, uh, spaces and opportunities for the language to be used in, in those more informal settings are some of the most challenging ones going. Um, 
uh, there are a variety of uh, initiatives that have been undertaken uh, in places like uh, New Zealand with Maori, um, uh, some very interesting developments in the Basque country as well, um, the Basques and, and the, the Welsh in the European context are, are really leaders in, in trying to deal with this issue of promoting the social, social use of the language. One last thing I'd, I'd say about Aboriginal languages um, is um, uh, many of them are extremely threatened. Um, and there's been interesting work done over a large number of years, um, pioneered um, uh, by a, a, a linguist at the University of California, Berkeley, Leanne Hinton, who's now retired. But uh, many, a couple of decades or more ago, she developed um, uh, what she called master apprentice programs. The situation for many Californian indigenous languages was very similar to the languages of the West Coast uh, of Canada, a very small number of speakers, mostly elderly people. And uh, the, uh, working with the California state government, they set up a program which funded um, usually rel relatives, younger relatives of these native speakers to work intensively up to 20 hours per week with the older native speakers. Um, and these have had some success. Interestingly, um, in Nova Scotia, where there's now efforts uh, underway to um, revitalize Gaelic, or Gaelic as Nova Scotians call it, um, they've adopted a, a similar methodology where um, there have been programs established for not ab initio learners, but um, young people who have come to some measure of fluency uh, who work one on one with an older native speaker. Um, and this really has improved uh, the outcomes and levels of fluency and command over idiom and so forth. Um, but um, certainly things like uh, there's been a lot going on in Canada um, in, in, uh, on reserves and elsewhere with languages like um, Mi'kmaq, uh, for example, the, the, the wealth of learning materials has really um, uh, become um, um, quite impressive. Uh, but um, this requires investment. I don't know whether I answered your question, but I rambled on long enough. Thank you so much, Robert. Yeah, I think that you answered that uh, quite extensively. Thank you. Um, we have a question from someone in our audience, Giuseppe Amatuli. I'm going to, oh, you're already unmuted. You're ready to go. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, I really, really enjoyed your presentation. Um, so I, I'm a PhD candidate at Durham University in the Department of Anthropology and I did my field work in northeastern British Columbia with the Doig River First Nation. And uh, they speak uh, beaver. I mean, there are around 40, 45 people in the community who are still able to speak. And uh, so basically, I just have a follow up on what you have just said and what Glenn was asking you. Because, you know, uh, when I was there, I, um, I spoke with like many members. And basically when, uh, when it comes to, uh, to the use of the, their own language, they are ashamed. They really don't want to speak because they feel like, you know, ashamed of speaking their language. And uh, there are so many people who, you know, are able to understand, but they, they just don't, they cannot speak. They don't even try to speak. And, uh, and you know, Technically speaking, they are called silent speakers because they can they can listen, they can hear, they can, you know, they can understand everything, but they they cannot reply. So I was just um, in uh, several interviews that I had uh, about you know um, boarding school and intergenerational trauma. Uh, they told me that you know they are seriously uh, still. Uh, addressing those issues in a way that you know even within the the context they are not able to to feel comfortable and so you know when you were saying it is important to create the opportunity uh, to to speak the language i would say that also the social context is fundamental and you know i was in fort st john so in you know it's an oil and gas town and probably it's not the best context to you know for indigenous people to speak their language but i think it is absolutely you know fundamental for um, members and uh, 
even uh, for locals who may be interested in learning a bit of, you know, uh, indigenous language to feel comfortable and in the right context in order to speak a language. And I think this is probably one of the uh, main challenges, right, when it comes to, you know, revitalization and uh, uh, the use of the language, because if you don't feel uh, like, you know, confident and comfortable, it's not going to happen, no matter the amount of money that you have, and no matter how many years you study the language. So, yeah, that's just one of the comments that, yeah, I just wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, and um, uh, Giuseppe, and um, uh, please get in contact. I'm fascinated by your work, and I'd like to hear more. Uh, very important work indeed. I just, uh, I won't say too much, except that, um, you know, having worked with minority languages in, in Europe, mainly for 20 years, and particularly with Celtic languages, what you describe is is very familiar um, to, to, to me, um, and it's one of the major problems. Um, and, you know, one of the arguments for legislation, one of the arguments for um, minority language media, uh, another important area that um, is not covered at all in the legislation, um, is that it increases the status and helps um, uh, uh, create a sense that these languages do have value. Um, and very important in the context uh, that you describe, where for generations, everything that the society has told speakers of these languages, that the languages are not important. In fact, that they are a burden, um, that they're a mark of uh, their inferiority and so forth. And, these are, uh, uh, the, 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 this is a feature of, of every linguistic minority, but because of the particular experience that Indigenous peoples have, um, that experience is, is one which, you know, compared to um, Gaelic speakers or Welsh speakers or Basque speakers is really one that's on steroids, I would say, you know, it's just a, an order of magnitude more intense. Um, and in that context, one piece of legislation no matter how well intended, uh, isn't going to make a difference. It's how institutions actually perform. And what you mentioned about the, the town is very important as well. And this is one area where I think it is important. Um, the attitudes of the majority, research on minority languages, all point to the importance of the attitudes of the majority. Um, in Scotland, still, we see a lot of negativity about Gaelic you know, based on old language ideologies. And we see this in spades in, in, in Canada. There's much more enlightened view, I think, now amongst many as reflected in, in the legislation, reflected by people like Mark Miller, who's gone to considerable lengths to acquire um, a very difficult language for a person who speaks an Indo-European language. Um, but, um, you know, there's a huge amount of hostility and suspicion. Um, and that um, is um, a, a matter for education. Um, but when you have such deeply um, embedded patterns and, uh, and attitudes, it's extremely difficult and challenging to deal with them. So thank you for your point, and uh, I, I'd really like to hear more of your work. I might also mention that I had a sort of Homer Simpson do mo moment. I said people can write me for the PowerPoint, then I, I remembered that I can probably circulate it by a uh, chat message. So uh, if you haven't noticed, I've uh, uh, sent my, um, my PowerPoint to everybody, but if you don't happen to get it, um, just let me know. I'm happy to provide that to you or, or any, anything else that I'm able to. Thanks for sharing that with everyone, uh, Robert. That's great. Uh, I, I see that it was received here in the chat, so everyone has access to it now. Um, the next question goes to Tony McCullough. Thank you, Christina. Yes, uh, Rob, I very much enjoyed your talk, learned a lot from it. Can I just say before my question, which is a sort of comparative Canadian one, your work on Gaelic and, and the fact that your email replies in Gaelic as well as English, reminds me that uh, my uh, French teacher at school, very old fashioned grammar school in South London, when he saw my name on, on the first day of McCulloch, insisted on uh, whenever he, he referred to me, and in those days you referred to pupils by their surname, or they did in this school, he would insist on saying McCulloch 
usually in front of me and splattering me in the process. But he asked me if I spoke Gaelic. And of course, that was very unlikely in Camberwell, South London, but I went as far as getting a Gaelic English dictionary uh, and about five minutes looking at that uh, convinced me I was better off trying to learn French. Um, but anyway, no, I, I very much enjoyed your talk. Uh, I, I've got, if it's not unfair, a comparative question, which is obviously Canada's historic treatment of its indigenous peoples and their indigenous languages, like every other country, one has to say, has not been good. Um, but uh, I get the sense, and, and I think your talk has uh, confirmed it a bit, that in recent years, at least, Canada's government has been trying a bit harder, relatively speaking, than comparative countries. And you particularly mentioned the US, Australia, New Zealand, which voted against the UN declaration in 2007. And I, I don't think they've changed their minds, have they? Um, well, they may have done. Uh, whereas do, do you think relatively it's, you know, it is a relative question as far as you're aware, in terms of indigenous languages, at least, that Canada has been doing rather more to right past wrongs than, than some of the other countries? I think that's fair, um, at least in relation to other countries in the Anglophone world. Um, there's all sorts of interesting developments in Latin America. Um, Paraguay, notably, is um, has uh, uh, an indigenous language as a co-official language, uh, Guarani, um, and um, Bolivia as well, I think, and uh, also there's constitutional recognition of, I think, about 69 indigenous languages in Colombia. So there are some interesting developments in, in Latin America, but in the English-speaking world, I, I think that's fair. Um, I would say uh, I've been to New Zealand once, and there are some impressive things taking place there as well um, in terms of recognition. Um, I don't have time or space, and this is <coughs> British Association of Canadian, not um, um, a, a, a New Zealand studies, but um, um, one of their founding constitutional documents was um, the Treaty of Waitangi from 1842, entered into between the Maori and the the crown and um, uh, as a result of this and a tribunal that was set up to um, essentially determine claims brought under this treaty as to what they implied for things like fishing rights land rights and so forth there has been a lot of work done on language um, the difference and and now the new zealand anthem is bilingual when you watch new zealand play rugby you see them not only doing the haka, but they sing the uh, national anthem first in Maori. Most of the players have learned enough of it, and it's common now for non-Maori to um, to exchange greetings, and some are, are learning the language. So the, uh, New Zealand, I think, has made significant progress, but I think that the difference is um, in terms of the language itself. We're dealing with just one language rather than over 60. Um, and New Zealand's a big country, but it's not as big as Canada. Um, and Maori speakers are concentrated, uh, particularly in the North Island. Um, and for that reason, you know, Australia has done much less well, but they again face a, this huge diversity of uh, Aboriginal languages, which which New Zealand doesn't. But but I think there have been some really interesting developments taking place in New Zealand as well. Um, Australia has fared less well, I'd say, and the United States with some exceptions. I mean, there, there is legislation on language in the United States and um, um, some very significant um, um, efforts to support, uh, for example, Navajo. Um, but the, the picture is very mixed in the United States um, uh, with a very similar history to Canada in some ways, much, uh, much darker history. Okay, thank you. No, great answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robert and Tony. I don't believe there are any more questions for today. We have run out of time for today's session. Um, so James, did you have any closing remarks before I conclude today's session? I, no, I just wanted to thank Rob very much. I, I held back um, because I, I, I'm in a privileged position in Edinburgh. I, I can uh, 
you know, well, when circumstances so dictate, um, there, there is a possibility that, uh, that Rob and I can meet for a socially distanced uh, coffee at some point, uh, which I very much look, look forward to, to doing. But I just wanted to also express my, my thanks. Um, when I first heard Rob uh, talking on these issues quite some time ago, I just knew there was a constituency that would be as appreciative of, of, of his talk as, uh, and his, his insights as, as I was. And I'm very glad we've managed to do this, even under these strange Zoom circumstances and um, allow um, provide this forum for, for Rob to, to give the, the, this year's Echoes Lecture. That was just a terrific Echoes Lecture. And I want to just thank uh, Rob once again um, and pass back to you, Christina, and, and hope to see people again tomorrow morning or yeah, morning in Canada, but uh, afternoon here. Thanks so much, James. It was indeed a wonderful lecture. Thank you again, Robert. On behalf of Quan, I want to thank everyone in our audience uh, for joining us today. Uh, thank you to today's speakers and, uh, of course, to everyone at Fax, namely Tony, James, and Eleanor, for this wonderful collaboration. Please join us tomorrow for day two. We'll be concluding the Bax mini conference with two panels. The first panel will be on the October crisis and the second on public policy and constitution constitutional questions in Canada and the United Kingdom. Uh, that begins tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time and 4 p.m. British time.